because we're we already having always having um, clashes of um, lectures, so we needed to plan it out. So fortunately, also I, because based on the experience I had in April, I was um, also included in the space management committee of the college because of the knowledge I could, um, I could um, contribute, and then the. The, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not used to facing crowds, but I'm just trying. <laughs> so I was able to assist in a way in managing the facilities because also where my office is uh, situated is a, is a five or seven story building, and we had a lot of problems there. We have problems of facility and how to manage those facilities. We know we have lift problems there. We have. Um, how um, many is there is this helping the problems we have in that building? We had all sorts the plumbing issues, we have electrical issues, we have all sorts of issues there. So, based on the little knowledge I had in April, but it's not little, based on the knowledge I had, we were able to at least prefer some solution to the problems we are encountering there. And also, other areas that uh, we, we talked, um, pardon me, we, 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 we talked about um, um, tenants, um, was it tenancy? Um, tenancy agreement. Tenancy agreement, yes. And that knowledge also assisted me because I had some relatives that had um, properties and then they had issues with their tenants. So I was able to just contribute my little quota to assist them. So please follow me that. Thank you, Madam. She's one of the participants at the last workshop. And uh, I pick on her because of a particular reason. She paid. And she said, ah, okay, I won't be able to go for physical workshop because I'm not seeing she just puts to bed and is not in three plates. So she could not make it down and I now told her, please do not. I am even ready to allow you to attend free of cards if that was the reason why you won't be able to attend. Because you see, not bed is something you cannot quantify in harm of cost. And I was happy she made it down. Even though she, she planned to leave every 2 p.m., which she couldn't. She couldn't. And I knew for somebody who has sacrificed that type of time, effort, it means something to her. So thank you, Madam, for uh, your participation. The second person that I will call upon to come and talk is the assistant director facility units of Niger Delta Development Commission, all the way from Totaco. to tell us about your experience at the last workshop and how that has affected and improved your performance. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, fellow facility managers. The last workshop was quite an enriching one. If I say I did not take away much from the workshop. I will definitely be lying. Uh, looking at my background, I'm actually an M and E engineer. So, uh, in terms of facility management, there's a whole lot that the M and E engineer is expected to. So, 
when I came to the workshop, it a kind of gave me insight that I did not have as an engineer to facility management. And to think that I, our commission, we had no facility management unit as it were, uh, but recently a facility management unit was created and yours truly was made the head of the unit. So, if I say the workshop and my membership of this institution or academy have not impacted in any way in my career, you can see I'll be far from the truth. So, that's basically what I have to share for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, He's been with a fellow of this institute. Uh, he was um, upgraded to a fellow Kenda in Joss. He was a corporate member during the last month, but now he's gracefully a fellow of the institution. Because this workshop afforded the opportunity to become a full member, not just getting skill or knowledge, but also get registered as a facility manager. And um, we, there is one particular candidate that is not here. He attended here online in April. His name is Ever Koku. He works with BEDC, Benin Electric Development Company. And um, at the time he came in April, he was not highly rated in his company. So after that training, he was just an associate member during the workshop. But because he did the exam during that workshop and he passed, with the certificate of attendance, he was upgraded to corporate membership level of the institute. And the company where he worked now created he uh, position wise and he was very happy. But if not for distance, he wanted to call the physical attender. Why we did this feedback is to let you know that yes, you paid so much to attend. Some of you were used to attend the workshop of 30,000, 25,000, but this workshop will be here and they will have little or no value to what you pay for. But what we try to do here is to ensure that we reach down deep to individual and ensure that the skill is impacted on to us differently. Like this morning now, can we see those who are online? Let's see those who are online. The topic for opening is service delivery and performance management. Service delivery and performance management. But before we go into that, is in your hand to your proceeding. That's the first topic. Modunai, have you? Service delivery and performance management. You can move to them.
There was a research done about 20 years ago by Professor Bayo Olaje, who is sleep now. The research was on performance of artisan and craftsmen in indigenous construction company and multinational construction company. And they discovered that, okay, there are high quality works carried out by multinational construction companies like the Australia, Nigerian PSC, um, Stabilini, Fusiboni, Nigeria, Kappa, and Kappa and Kappa. Whereas when you come to Mr. John C. and Co., you find that the performance or the quality of work delivered is not of the same level with the multinational construction company. And the question was asked, why was there a variance if the workers that were used by Johnson and Co. and Milosvaja and Co. are sourced from the same place? It is the same Nigerian artisans and craftsmen that Milosvaja used, the same Nigerian artisans and craftsmen that Johnson and Co. used, but there was a different there was a variance in the performance of these workers. The research discovered that the problem was attributable to management. Management of these workers. That those who manage the artisans and craftsmen in Yugoslavia, Nigeria Limited were more direct and in control than those who are managing in the local indigenous construction company. As a result, the performance of the workers in Julius better is better, much far, far more better than those in Johnson and Co. That brings about the importance of this topic, service delivery and performance Management. Where there is no performance management, there is no service delivery. Can you please move this slide? Okay. Um. This topic, as I said, is facility maintenance and repairs workshop, FMO2, and is being delivered by that Dr. Rufemi E. Adishola, who is the national chairman and president of Living Free and Nigerian Academy of Facility Manager. With me on this side of the table is the incoming president and national chairman of Living Free, uh, Mr. Patire Do. Can you please write down for That. Uh, the second person on the table is Mr. Engineer Obukoro Oyekoro Jeffrey, the Assistant Director, Head of Facilities, Niger Delta Development Commission. The two of them are for Niger Delta Development Commission, and the two of them came yesterday night from Portacot for this workshop. So, you are welcome. Now, um, when we talk of performance management and facility maintenance, uh, any organization Any organization that wants to improve, that want to improve and be competitive in the market, we have no choice but to 
carry our we call our commons management. Well, let's look at this all. For those of you who were here in April, let me simply ask you a question. Is there any difference between this all now and the all that we use in April for this training? Anyone that is here that time can raise up his hand and answer that question. And the uh, greater guy of the Yes, I think I can see some small improvements. They don't complain about Okay. He observed there are some improvements. But the gap that you will have noticed, because they did not do performance management, when we came here, we found out that there was a wide gap in what we saw at the last conference, last workshop, and what we had on ground now. Most of the table does not even have table plots. So this morning, I had to send somebody out to go and hire table plots. Because even if they do not maintain the facility they have, we want to maintain the standard we have set. And because of that, when you walk in, you did not notice the difference. But we, who are that was here, noticed that difference. And that was because there was nothing like performance management and monitoring. If they have done performance management and monitoring, they would have known that the standard that this place has was not met again. Before we chose this three guest house, we had opportunity to use the Bar College of Tech Royal Guest House, the Gentleman of Medical Research Center, Louis Lack uh, Guest House. But we put all the facilities together, evaluated them one by one, and this three guest house came on top. And that was why we chose this place. Apart from that, we look at the in-house provisions for electricity, comfortability, that is AC. We look at the room accommodations, and we saw that there is proximity to the workshop venue using this place than Royal Guest House, Kerber College of Tech, or Guest House in the University of Lagos. But you see there is a proverb in Africa that to become a top-notch person is not a difficult issue. The difficult issue is maintaining that level of status. The problem we have noticed here was because the management yes, they rented it out, they got paid, but they do not maintain what they have. And if they had a plan for performance monitoring and evaluation, they would have noticed the shortfall in the performance of this hall between April and now, which is just about a six-month period between April and now. So any individual organization who wants to improve and grow must get linked up to performance management and evaluation. It is so essential that performance measurement tools are employed and developed for helping the organization to improve its, in its competitiveness and profitability. The basic drive of all business entities is to make profit. So if they are going to make profit, what they are selling must be attractive to their buyers. 
the impact of not meeting law is that they will lose customer. And if they lose customer, they will lose revenue. And if they lose revenue, they will lose profit. So, as we are saying this, think about your organization, where you come from. Are you from works and services? Are you from facility management units? What are those services your unit rendered? Those services that you are rendering, are you maintaining those services? Are you projecting how those services will be the next five years? Otherwise, if you you bank on what you are doing now, as what will be doing the next five, ten years, you may discover that you may be driven out of business. Because as we go in this topic, you will note that competitiveness is the soul of business. There is a direct link of facility management and performance management. Without establishing a link with facility management and uh, performance management, then there will be shortfall in the expectation of the customer. For example, major distinction between public utility uh, organizations like Works and Services, the other way of them, Works and Services, University of Lagos, Works and Services, WAEC, is that they do not bother on feedback. What we mean by feedback is not just complain. When you render a service, that service you have rendered, how did the people, the end user of those services, see what you have given to them? Did it meet their expectation? Was it was there a shortfall? In an institution based like Unilag and Yaba College of Tech, the end users of those services are two, the students and the staff. How does the staff perceive us when it comes to maintenance of facilities? How does the student perceive us when it comes to maintenance of facilities? Was there a standard that we set which we have to meet every time we maintain the toilets, every time we clean the street of the university and polytechnic, every time we provide electricity, every time we provide water. In maintenance, there's something we call turnaround time. Turnaround time is the shortest possible, possible time you have to ensure a surface disruption is brought back. Like if there is no electricity, there is a disruption to electricity surface. In an hotel where we are, within one minute, the electricity will be restored. Is it like that where you are? If you are the one maintaining the university system, if you are the one maintaining the polytechnic environment, if there is no facility, can the can the staff go, oh, don't worry, we don't want to we'll bring the light. Eh? So if there is performance management and there is a link between performance monitoring and management, then end users will be satisfied. What is the goal of performance management? Um, the basic goal is to improve the business performance. No matter what we are doing, when we were growing up in the village, we had big book seller. 
These big cake sellers use the same ingredients, beans, and they use it to prepare a big cake. Some of these big cake sellers started thinking of how to make a difference in their big cake. Some will put pepper. Some will put onions. Some started garnishing it with spices. So when you now eat big cake from number one seller, you eat big cake from number two seller, and you eat big cake from number three seller, you know which is the best. Then you can now tell whoever you are sending to go and buy. Don't buy from number one. Go back from number two, go to number three to buy the big cake for me. Because that person has improved his business performance. And that is the basic goal of performance management. Improve the business. Early this century, when the full set was introduced, the basic and the most improved handset in the country then were Sajem and Nokia. And Triumph. And what? Triumph. Okay. <laughs> and these are the basic handsets in the country then. If you don't have Nokia 3310, you don't have the handset. But the there is no performance evaluation, monitoring, and management in their business. If they have research and development units, they will have been monitoring their products by the end users. And because they, they were making profits and they were selling, they thought they were good. And within the five years of existence, they went into oblivion. You can't see Nokia again, you can't see Sajem again, you can't see all those brands again. Even though they were very strong, but they were not planning for their future. Compare those brands to Samsung and iPhone. In Samsung and iPhone, there is competitiveness. If iPhone 15 come out this year, then we can be sure that next year it's either iPhone 15A or iPhone 16. Yeah. Maybe they will have more camera. <laughs> then Samsung will also look at the direction of iPhone. If they had three cameras on their answer, they will have one more. The abundantly green research, and this research involves market solving. Market solving involves customer satisfaction, and these are the things they do. That's why the two companies, Samsung and the iPhone, were the toast of the town. They are very costly, and people still rush to buy them because they were end product of research and development. So any organization that wants to improve its small business area will also link performance monitoring to performance management. And it is essential that there will be research and development units in that organization. Facility performance can be traced to two related services, health and efficiency. There are other factors that are related to performance, like facility efficiency, hygiene standards, indoor air quality, energy efficiency, lighting standard, thermal comfort, safety, and information technology. All these are units of performance. If, as we are sitting down here, the air conditioners were not performing well, we have to be finding ourselves. I'm sure our unit 
reports, attentive rates will have been reduced. But because we don't have problem with comfortability, or performance comfort is good. Lighting is also good. We don't uh, scramble to get whatever we're looking for. The lighting is good. Then the indoor air quality is also good. It's not as if we are stuffy here. We have adequate in inside air quality. That's why we said all these are component unit of facility evaluation. If you have a hall, all these things we listed are not working well. That all will not work well. Now, why do we need performance management? The need is stated by me in 1998, the changing nature of war. We are on slide four now, changing the tour of work. If you look at the hall we are using as an example, yes, we say the hall is to provide uh, services for end users, but there is constantly changing environment for the use of this hall. Somebody had a bad day, he, he rented this hall, and they arrange the hall for dinner, birthday dinner. You will agree with me that the hall does not require network. They don't need facility for network, for birthday party. And uh, whether the lighting is good or not, they will still sit down because most of what they do under birthday party are done under shade of light. If this management focus is on that particular function they do, when other people come around to rent the hall for workshop like we're doing, then it won't meet the standard required. Not so. And that was why the first item there said the changing nature of work. The hall is standard but it has to accommodate and provide hosts to several events. And uh, because the changing hosting nature changes, then there will be constant performance monitoring and evaluation. Increasing competition. Now, at the time, you learn Guest House was one of the best. But because of the approach to public utilities, I remember when Oya Guest House was first commissioned by Yaba College of Health. People come and book ahead of time. There was a time Sonia Day was lodging there for more than one, two years. But I cannot go there again because it was not treated as a profit-oriented uh, guest house. Now, competition, even Unilac, we leave Unilac uh, guest house to come and rent accommodation here for their guests, either when they have accreditation or when they have assessment for their PhD candidate, they come out to rent home, even though they have their own that was not properly managed. Same thing happened to their college of them. So the increasing competition means that we have to maintain what we have. Specific improvement initiative. Specific improvement initiative. Now, if you look at the hall here, we have projector, we have two screen on the wall. We can even improve that two screen to four screen because we want participants to have first hand uh, experience 
in the workshop. And that is specific improvement initiatives. You saw that, okay, in most of their focus is on provision of projector and screen. But this all felt, okay, we should go beyond that. Let there be TV screen. And they provided T3 TV screen, one in the front, two by the side, and they still have provision for additional two, which they have not installed. The reason is to remain in the competition, so that if any other hall within the environment want to compete with them, they cannot surpass them. When we were making this space available yesterday, West Africa College of Graduate Study in Pharmacy came in to book for the use of this same call. The only problem this call has from our first experience was their network. The network here is terrible. But we did something this time around. What we did was we, we bought the network booster and we came in with the 5G Wi-Fi. And we're also using their internal Wi-Fi to address the network problem. We have a multi-approach to bring that problem under zero so that we won't have the kind of challenges we had last time. But that was not provided by the management of this hotel. It was provided by us because we know what we wanted and we knew the service quality we expected. Now, uh, national and international award. FMO1, we have eight international participants from Malaysia, from UK, from Hong Kong that took part in the last workshops. Our uh, experience we had on network and last workshop was instrumental for those international participants not connecting this time because most of them call. I forgot. We enjoy what we did last time, but network problem. How do you intend to address? I told them we are making effort to address the network problem, but they didn't believe in us. They thought it was just for Six man talk. However, we put a lot of things in motion to address the network problem, which I felt the management of this hotel supposed to do. Because when we leave, all the things we brought here, we are taking them away. The toilet here, you can eat your breakfast inside. Because it smells nice, very clean. Before you finish using the toilet, the attendant that we maintain and clean it is already there. Unlike our various toilets in the institutions, when students use the toilet, it is not attended to, and um, until the next student comes in, even if the water is not running, they don't bother to flush. They leave it like that. And there is no monitoring, no performance monitoring, nobody to check whether the user has flushed that thing or has refused to flush it. Is the water running? Is the water not running? You see, this problem was so germane in a Unilab sometimes we told that. The management have to contract out the uh, facility maintenance of some of their hostels. At the time I was doing my PhD in Unilad, my hostel was Erastos, Akimbadi, Akimbolade, Akimbolade, and it was handled and managed by an ethics of yours and Vadwa. It was allocated out. It, is, it wasn't handled by staff of Unilad. And we paid about 130,000 every year to that company 
for maintenance of the hostel. And because of that, it was privately run and it was well maintained. They realized that the PG Hall embodied a class of people that need to be properly taken care of if they can pay for the services to be rendered. So they arranged for it. But what happened to the general hostels? Nothing like that. What is good for the Jews is good for the gender. If you feel that some set of students are better qualified for better treatment than other set of students, in the same environment, it is not a good customer satisfaction index. So, there must be a standard for comparing what we provide in A to what we provide in B. If paraventure, you have a college of tech, said, okay, what we are providing in PG Hall is the minimum standard we will provide in <coughs> only roof. These are two different hostels there. Then, they will be looking at what was in the PG Hall to monitor what is in the only room. Because what was in the PG Hall has become a benchmark for performance evaluation of what is in the only room. But because there is this misnomer and belief that students put in Hollywood are miscreants, they are not to be given the best uh, services. But what they have forgotten is that this Hollywood is the same property of the Malibu, just as the PG or so what is good for PGO is good for Hollywood. If you want to increase cost of maintenance and management, put it there. People who will take it to do what? We take it and enjoy the services you want to render. At the time, PGO of Java College of Tech is a rented apartment. People who stay there are not they are not students. There are workers who come in, rent the place, and sleep there overnight. Then uh, in the morning, they go to their respective places of work. In the evening, they come back, sleep overnight, and the following morning, they go out again. The student that the place was meant for cannot even use the place. So we need to establish standards for comparison. Now, let there be feasibility and scoreboard for people to monitor their own performance level. Now, the work and services staff, how do they measure their own performance? It is important that one of the services rendered by work and services is to inspect, carry out inspection on facilities of the university, the same thing for uh, the technique. How often do we go out for inspection of this facility? There is routine inspection. Routine inspection, nobody asks. But we have to carry out this inspection. In Europe, in Britain, what they normally do is the cleaners, the janitorial staff, in the morning when they are going to do cleaning, when they are going to sweep, they, there is a place they keep for, for each and every one of them. Any area where you walk, you have to report on it and return that form to a central unit. So we can now look at what is recorded every day on each of these units. If the toilet to service or a team a tap is broken, a bidet is broken, 
It will be recorded in your report that is taken to the central unit. The central unit will collect all these things and send out inspector to go and inspect those things and cost what it will take to replace them. Within a day, the entire report has been generated, cost of displacement is generated, and the following two days of the following two days, damaged properties or facilities are replaced. But you see in Nigeria today, we don't make use of all these people. The cleaner, they clean offices before the officers are entered the office. So they know what is in that office, what they see there and what they are not seeing there. Let them report every day if what they met in the office is the same with what they left there yesterday. If there is a difference, they will take note of it and put it in their report. And the collation officer will see all this thing, generate it, and send it to the required uh, unit. In the software that will be using on, Paul, on Friday, he, there is an aspect of it that takes care of all those things. In that software, when you go for inspection, you come back and enter whatever your report is into the software. And the director of public and services can access your report from the software in his own office. Now, the buster can also access your uh, software, the software from his end to look at the cost and approve. And this is what we call computer management, maintenance management software. It helps us to fasten the process of green work. And um, when you have high quality problems, it lets you know where you have to put priority. The problem, as we are in this hall now, the problem of all, of this hall may be light. It may be air conditioning system. It may be network. For those of us who are physically here, network will not be our problem. For those that are online, network will be their priority. Not so? Yes. Lighting here will be our problem. AC here will be our problem. AC, for those who are online, is not their problem. Lighting is not their problem. Their priority is network. So the quality of the problem you have will determine priority attention you are going to give to it. Now, when you look at the facilities you are managing, the performance management justifies the use of resources you employ. If, you, if the management of this all look at how much they are spending to maintain this all, they can say we are spending 50000 every month towards maintenance of this all. But the performance of this all will justify the amount being spent. If what this all is giving back, cannot be quantified in terms of 50,000 that is spent on it every month. Then it means it is not justified. So whatever the service, the facility is giving back to you will be justified. And uh, you measure condition and functionality of building and its infrastructure are suitable and appropriate for intended function. I have explained that when I was introducing the use of this call, if AC is not working, lighting is not working, network is not working, what this call was designed to do, we don't be able to do it. And that is why under the need for renewal replacement of building and infrastructural system, 
e.g. heating and cooling, electrical exterior envelope, system component, cooling power, heat exchanger, chiller and pump is important for maintenance. Because if all those units are not working, then overall comfort and efficiency of the facility is already compromised. So if you say ah, sewage system is not working, there is no water system, there is no electricity, then what you are doing, lecturing that you are giving in the hall, is not lecturing. Because all these things were designed to make lecturing enjoyable, comfortable, and they are no longer working. Then it means what you expect as output from all these things that are no longer there make lecturing a difficult and uncomfortable process for the student. Why do we do performance management? To determine company financial sources. If I look at the cost of building this hall is 10 million. The cost of maintaining it every month is 50,000. What this hall generates every month is 5 million. Then I have to look at, is it worth investing money on? Yes, 5 million plus 50,000, that's 5 million, 50,000 every month. And I base it to 10 million, which means in a speed of, in a sphere of three months or four months, I will have the capital invested on it. So the company is invested in profits. What this unit is designed for is to bring in money to the company. What the rooms were designed for is to bring in money for the hotel. So the money that the rooms were bringing is different from the money that the all are bringing. If, the, if one is bringing in money and the other one is not bringing in money, the one that is not bringing in money <coughs> is going to affect the running of the one that is bringing in money. In some organization, they set big hotels, like charity, they have marketing units. Marketing units that will go and look for people that come and do their uh, conference room. That will go and market the conference room, instead of it to stay idle. That's one thing they don't do here. Except you walk into them, you want to do the house. They don't come to you to come and do their house. And that makes it redundant for most of the time. And you can imagine we are using this place for three days and we are spending close to one million for the use. So if it is used, even if it is done three days in a week and you make one million every week, in 55 weeks of 52 weeks, that would be 2 million. If you remove the running cost, you still have the money left. So the purpose of facility performance evaluation and monitoring is to determine the financial success of the company. Now, some scholars have developed various methods of measuring performance. The first one that was developed by Dustin and Kaplan in 1980 was activity-based costing. This activity-based costing was how much does it cost to run the AC? How much does it cost to run the projector? How much does it cost to make sure that there are chairs and table in the hall? What is the total aggregate cost? That is activity-based cost. In 1987, they have what they call activity-based management. 
that even if you have all this activity-based budgeting, if there is no effective management in place, they will not make much profit. So they develop what we call activity-based management. If you look at uh, the projector is not showing the game. If you look at the screen, you will see that financial performance at the six cell uh, is, is the first from the six element of performance according to Brown. Yes, money is the basic bedrock of everything. If the company does not make profit, it will close down. So financial performance is very important. But what we make financial performance successful is products of service quality. Like I said, when Nokia was coming up with a very strong handset, and they did not look at innovative products, very in less than three or four years, we were out of business. But when you look at the uh, iPhone, iPhone look at the market. What is it that these people need? Do you know that with the current iPhone in the market, you can monitor your blood pressure. You can monitor your blood pressure. You don't need to go and see a medical doctor to monitor and measure your blood pressure because those apps are already in the iPhone. In the Samsung, those apps are already there. So they, they start researching into the need of the people and they provide all those things that make life very comfortable for the users of their facilities or their product. And that is product service quality. So supplier performance. You will agree with me that this money one of our suppliers who was to bring in the tea, to bring in the uh, breakfast, did not come as scheduled. It was meant to be here by 9 a.m. or even coming until about 8 minutes to 10. And he apologized that he had the uh, hiccups in terms of eggs. And we know there is nothing about that do when it comes to issues of eggs. But your supplier can make a mess of everything you are doing. If you don't have a supplier that is effective and knows his onion, you will discover that whatever effort you are putting up, the supplier will make a mess of it. So you need a very good supplier performance. Then we, we keep talking about customer satisfaction. I'm still waiting for a time when a Nigerian institution will have a feedback from the users of their facility. For example, let students fill a form at the end of every week. How is their classroom? How is their hostel? How is their toilet facilities? How is the catering services? How is the security network? And these feedback are to be added together to appraise the performance of the management in the organization. If you are not doing this, you did not have in this customer satisfaction, then you have not started working at all. Process and operational performance and employee satisfaction. All these are important. Look at that pyramid. This pyramid, uh, you have objective on the left side, then you have core, core business process on the right side. The objective is with the arrow looking downward. The core business is looking upward in the arrow. And when you look at it, you will see that the fission is divided into two. Because the company fission is part of the objective and uh, part of the measures that has to be worked upon. If you don't work on the company fission, you will not be able to achieve the company objective. The fission 
was fashioned from the objective. So we need to work from the objective to get the public vision. Like I said, marketing is a strategic unit for you to remain in business. Financial performance, we've spoken so much about it. Customer satisfaction, we've spoken so much about it. Flexibility is what Nokia, Sager, and other brands of food does not have. But when you come to Samsung and iPhone, they have flexibility. You know, uh, Samsung today has dual phone, dual SIM, not so. They have dual SIM. But if you look at Nokia of yesteryear, it's only SIM, one SIM, one SIM. iPhone, some of them have dual SIM. And because of that, it is the customer satisfaction that is making that possible. Today we have Techno, we have Infinix, we have Oppo. This was what we call disruptive innovative system. Disruptive innovation. When uh, the MD of uh, MD of Plus look at what can we do to ensure that the Imagine market economy in Nigeria address the need of the people. They discover they need market solving and discover that a typical Nigeria, a typical Nigeria have two, three assets. One for Airtel, one for Airtel, one for Group. Uh, and it is no longer comfortable. So going around the three answers. So we said, what can we do? The MD stock went to China. And you come out with one set that have two C, one set that have three C. And the Chinese people came up with Shinko phone that, that had two C with terrible noise <laughs> at that time. So we get a very terrible noise, but gradually they modify and modify, and today you have Infinix, you have Techno, you have Oppo, from the same you, the same company. But as a friend, nobody goes around with two answers again. It's only one answer. But in the past, we go around with two, three answers, which has been addressed. We call that disruptive innovation. What is that thing missing? What is that thing missing in our operation? What is that thing we are not doing right and we have to do right? What is it that other people are doing that they are not doing right that we have to do right? And the moment you identify that, you introduce it. It doesn't matter whether you are government agency or public or private, you can make the difference in your organization if you introduce what is missing in that organization. When I started my lecturing career in Yaba College of Tech, I noticed that most of the lecturers there they go to the classroom with notes. They start reading, dictate and the student will be copying it. By the time they finish copying, you know that the end of the lecture. And I look at it, is that the kind of lecturers I want to be? If I handed up that thing, that means I've more imparted knowledge. I think I don't have the knowledge I'm giving. If you have the knowledge you want to give to me, you will be able to control your mind. You don't need to read from book. So I now develop a system where I will walk into the classroom with my hands like this. And I will do my three hours lecture, be instructor, be the estimation and estimation uh, and price analysis, be construction management. I don't want to start to tell you the book. And I will do my three hours lecture, 
and my student will be writing notes. Because those letters were spiced with practical exams. We noticed that since we started this lecture, we will be using either this or because the reason why we are using this or is what we can relate it here. I don't know the background of each and every one of you, but we are all inside this hall, and we can see. It. So we are using the uh, use student back for those who are from student back, our blue Java College of Tech for those who are from the other College of Tech, and those of you who are from uh, institution based like Mark, so you can go out with Tech because for for the glory of for the glory of God, we have representative from. We should have gone up from the technical level for that. We have from the university, we have from the other level of tech, and we have private individuals and social uh, organizations who are attending this workshop. So we have to ensure that the experience of us. The experience of so when I introduced that style in the other college of tech, when I was teaching. My students, most of them are lecturers students. Even as we are sitting here, I can point to a few of my students that are sitting down here. They will bear witness to what I'm talking about. And uh, they will come to me and tell that this thing you are teaching us. Why don't you make textbook for me? You know it now. And that was how my first textbook came out. Uh, my first textbook was on business of him. Came out because my students inspired it. Then, then when estimating and price analysis, they came in here and said, "Ah, you've been teaching us this course for many years, and you don't use textbook. Can you do a textbook that we help?" That was how tendering and the estimation and construction industry came out. Then, professional practice and procedure, which is being used all over the country today, was also inspired by my students. Because they enjoy the procedure uh, undertaking to teach them. And that is the point I'm driving at. You can make a difference in where you work. Don't wait and say, oh, this is the way we do things in Unilateral, this is the way we do things in Yabate. Then it means you have left nothing from here. This we have learned nothing from here. When you do meeting, management meeting in your in your unit, most of this new idea you can suggest them. So that from the workshop we went to this type of thing were given as something we can use. Like when I started I said the cleaners can be used to feed person, even if they are not properly trained. Some of them can be retrieved and see the questionnaire. And uh, you know, in the past, cleaners were under works and services. And all those papers that they feed when they work, they feed it and return it to work. An officer is sad to the person of collecting those information. So that at a glance, we know what is wrong in the school. No, there is no way a cleaner will not clean in the morning. Either the toilet facilities, the classroom, and things like that. That is one. Other things that institution can use, the students can be used to free from they are the end user, to free form of the facilities they are using. Is it okay? Which of it is bad? Instead of waiting for customer to feel complete form, this world has gone beyond that day. Don't wait the complaint is given. Give form, develop form that every week each classroom return those form to you for assessment. And with that, we will keep abreast of development in the unit. The same thing in organization, corporate organization like Niger Delta Development Commission, all offices supposed to be given form to feed, to know what are the status of facilities in their offices 
so that they can keep abreast of management and maintenance of them. You don't have to wait till somebody, an office holder, says, My AC is bad, it's not working again. No, it, it means there is a failure in the aspect of the FM unit. If they have to complain before you put that in the time, the, the, the essence of that is this. If I allow my system to break down before I maintain my system, then it means I'll be losing a lot of things. So you don't allow the system to break down before you maintain it. That is why these values are added to what we're doing. Now, we have what we call quality award approach. If this quality award approach is on the screen, it's equally in your, in your proceeding. Planning, we start with planning. At the planning stage, depending on what you are managing, you look at setting smart goals. The goals and objectives you want the organizations to achieve. To achieve. You just don't set the goal, you act on them too. You implement them. And that implementation will require monitoring through checking and feedback. When we started this lecture, I said a parent with two children or two kids and gave them a task to work on. You monitor one, you don't monitor the second one. At the end of the day, the one that is monitored performs better than the one that is not monitored. So there is need to monitor the implementation of your goal setting. And when you are monitoring, you will be observing some of those things are not working according to plan. Why is it not working according to plan? Then you need to review. You need to review. Sometimes ago, uh, university and polytechnic have staff that are doing cleaning work, security work. But today, all these services are outsourced. They are no longer under the domain of uh, works and services as staff of the unit or staff of the university. However, they may have an oversight. Work and services directors they have an oversight function over this unit because it's under their management. Now, the review, as you are monitoring and you observe variance, you observe deviation from the plan target, then you review it. Then you rate, which is the final aspect, rating your workers, because they are key element of performance. How are the workers keen in into your corporate objective? Because the workers can mess up everything. If you have laudable goals, you have uh, good plans, you have monitoring, effective monitoring systems, and you have reviewed perfectly, and you don't have good workers. Everything you have done will come back to me. So you need to rate your workers. It's not a matter of mouth. I've worked with federal government, federal ministry of works and housing for 21 years before I came into the lecture. And those 21 years, each time they are sacking people, they put me aside. They don't touch me. Even when I resign that I want to go and face the term, they specifically call me, I've not seen it in ministry, they specifically call me, that why are you leaving? We're not saying you should go now. We still want you around. And I said, I think I have done enough in the ministry. Let me go and try my hand somewhere else. And uh, up until today, I still go back to the ministry, and I still enjoy the camera direct 
among the staff that I worked with when I was there. Now, the rating you give your staff will let you know who are your best staff. Who are your best staff? Who are the ones you can send away? That whether they are there or not, work with all. These are important. And when you do that, you will notice that you will have nothing but performance management. You see, I've mentioned various units of uh, measurement uh, for performance. Activity-based costing, activity-based management, financial ratio, and uh, there are eight or ten performance measurement tools. But this triangle you see here is what we use in evaluating this performance model. Anything you are doing, you have to look back. The Yoruba people say when a kid falls down, he looks ahead. But when an elderly person falls down, he looks backward. You need to look backward, look back at your operation, and find out what are those things you are not doing right. You cannot be God. You can't be doing everything right. Okay, you cannot be God. Those people online, are they getting, are they hearing us? You cannot be God who does everything right. So you will need to take a look at some of the things you have done in the past. So that's why you look back. Then you look ahead. Project in Unilag in the next 10 years. How is the surface delivery going to be like? Some of the students today are richer than the lecturers. Yes, because the lecturers did not look in work. They've gotten knowledge in various fields and all the soft skills that goes with knowledge based economy today. They don't they don't go into it. Now somebody is attending an interview today. He called me. He's a facility manager. Uh, they ask him how do they use QuickBook? They ask him how do they use SPV? I said all these are accounting software that you need to have learned how to use them from our uh, platform, Nigerian Academy of Facility Managers um, website on ALINC, because we are in partnership with ALINC, they open the website for us. You can go there, learn any trade free of charge, any skill free of charge. The only thing is that when you do the test, or you must do the test, when you do the test and you pass, you pay 10 euro for your certificate. But the test, whatever they are teaching you, is free. It's free. So you have access to all these facilities by becoming a member of our institution and by undertaking this course with us. You go to the website, like this morning I was reviewing the website and I saw that uh, in the last one week, they told me the number of people who has registered, the number of courses that have been completed, the number of courses that are ongoing, and I can still see it on my Google. Every day they send the report to us on how we are progressing in that website. And that website we open after the first, uh, during the FM01. During the FM01. So we, you need to update your skill regularly because most of the skills we have today are not uh, what we expected. Like I've said, we need to compare. Of, or if you use that tool to evaluate 
about 10 models of facilities uh, performance measurement tools. The only one that can be said to be perfect is balance forecast. Balance forecast. Because this balance forecast is in four perspectives. Financial perspective, business perspective, learning and growth perspective, technological growth perspective. And you want to assess the organization on these four perspectives. How are we doing financially? How are we doing technological wise? How are we doing business wise? How are we doing in the last perspective? And if you perform well in all these four perspectives, then it means the organization is good. The key performance indicators, like when we were discussing the use of this stuff, what are those key performance indicators that we show all that this all is functioning well. Who can tell us? Key performance indicator of that all is good. Yes, they have been here two time. How do you know it's good? Oh, the AV is perfect. That's one key performance indicator. The lighting is what? Good. There is no, the inside air quality is good. These are key performance indicators. So as a facility manager, in whatever you are doing, you must identify your key performance indicator. What are those key items that you will need to identify to know that your services are being delivered properly? Then, your performance review. You must be able to review your performance to show that you know what you are doing. This is the diagram of balance contact. You have customer perspective, financial perspective, internal business process, and learning and growth perspective. You measure the progress of a company on each of these perspectives, and uh, when you do it, you come up with a score. Like I said, there is no perfect human being. Balance forecast is the best, but it has an, it has an anomaly. The, do you want to know the, the anomaly of balance forecast system? Yes, sir. The, the anomaly is that when you use balance forecast, to rate the organization. If you only come back in qualitative term, is fair, is good, is excellent, is poor. But you see, when you rate the organization using these indices, something can be fair last year and still be fair this year, but with minor improvement. Some you could say Fear is 40 to 45. Last year it was 40. But this year is 45. Was there no improvement? But if it is only 45, if it is only fear, you record it. How do you know there is an improvement? So what we have done is that we have improved balance contact to transform qualitative reading into quantitative reading. And that is why in the next lecture we will be having uh, on performance management and evaluation. There is what we call balance forecast software. That balance forecast software, we ask people, we ask you to download. For those of you who have not been able to download because you are just coming up, you are not joining this morning, we will give you the link to download the balance forecast software. And you can use it to measure your organization. If you are doing well, if you are not doing well. Another software we're going to give you is a Stadium Facility Maintenance Pro. 
it is a generic software that is going to be used for maintenance management of any facility. We tried, we started it in FMO1, but the person we're going to teach us will come here to Italy this time around on Friday to teach us. Then, um, measuring parameters. Because I told you, the problem we find with balance for is that it only gives you descriptive rating. It's fair, it's poor, it's excellent. So we develop a system where we transform balance forecast from its original process into quantitative measurement tool. And this is what we use. Um, if you look at a defect, what is the performance in a defect? How often does this failure of defect occur in a year? Then we give it a weighted one. Then maintenance strategy used. Uh, breakdown preventive combined. Physical state of facility is it very good, good satisfactory lockdown. When you look through those tables, you will see the weighted value attached to those items, which we incorporated into the software. Then when you now rate it between uh, 20, you have 21 criteria achieved, you award three points. You have 15 to 20, two points. 11 to 14, one point. Zero to 10, zero point. By the time you do that, you will have transformed your balance forecast to quantitative uh, measuring tools. And uh, the conclusion of this talk is that performance management is such an essential tool that we cannot overlook in facility management. Every facility we are managing will either perform or fail. And if it performs, we measure the performance, is it at the same level or is improving? And the tools to measure those performance, we have discussed about them. And um, we have identified what that is the best, which is the balance forecast. And this balance forecast system will further improve from qualitative to quantitative. And we'll be doing that quantitative measurement using balance forecast software in the next lecture. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Is um, Wilson. The next person is Wilson. Is Permit me to, okay, th thank you. Permit me to rely on the existing protocol our chairman has laid in the course of this uh, workshop. Uh, I've been given a limited time, and while taking facility management in leisure management, uh, that will be the focus of our discussion this morning. And uh, in the course of this, we will be looking at uh, progress, 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 progress. We will be looking at uh, uh, how we will be focusing our attention on the management of affliction facilities. Looking at uh, different levels uh, by which previous has been classified. Uh, we will be defining benchmarking, uh, enumerate the factors affecting travels and jobs. We will look at hotel properties criteria, uh, task characteristics, attributes of an ideal leader in the leisure industry will be examined. 
We will discuss the goal of the Committee for Tourism, Education and Training, and the importance of human resources in the management of the leisure facilities. And of course, marketing, as with uh, the previous presentation, as a uh, look at. Look, what is leisure? Uh, from the from the one job, we try to look at what leisure is. Well, we come to a conclusion through the finish uh, the dictionary that these are free time, your spare time, your moments you do at your own uh, free period. What you do for relaxation, how do you recreate, what are those things that uh, encourage you and give you fun and pleasure. All this can be put together as uh, 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 what leisure should be like and what leisure is. And for every individual, what is leisure to you might not be a leisure to somebody else. So we want to look at the, as the, the, the origin of leisure's history. And it's also the, the existence of the old, uh, the beginning of human race. The anthropologists remark that leisure has been part of human life from the day God has created man. We have the day to relax and times to, uh, to to freelance, and this means different things to different people from different places, different culture. There are different ways of life, and the question is, how do you recreate? How do you spend your own free time? Uh, for people like us, we remember in those days, we know we had supposed to turn back. Uh, we tell story under the influence of our parents. Uh, we, we play Ludo, we play Ayo. Uh, to some, they do wrestling. We have some that they have their pastime as singing and dancing. And I wish I could have physically present in that event. I will have put it to you that what are the experience you have growing up? How do you uh, do your own pastime? We're looking at the Greek experience because they are the ones that actually has given us a, a good um, model that we are following now. So uh, when it comes to New York, the Greek experience is unique, and one of their philosophers, philosopher, uh, who is uh, Aristotle, he uh, posited that nature can be defined in three levels, and these are make, uh, entertainment, recreation, and reflection. And when you look at the people, the three people, and entertainment part of their life, recreation is, is, is part of their life. Reflection is part of what they do. And that's why we have a lot of philosophers coming from that end. And that's why you see people. What you now see as a uh, marathon, we have a lot of entertainment. So, the name, uh, definition of Aristotle. Uh, that medal is what we are going to be using for this discussion going forward. Modern day leisure takes its own uh, 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 is influenced by what has been defined by Aristotle's model. However, uh, what is a, a global good? This has also in this
which we are now uh, using as a model, taking a, a, a departure from Aristotle's as a um, made down for us. We give you a color video. Because this is the person who is speaking is speaking from our leader. Because we have authority. Tell us when you leave your home, uh, maybe in, in most of our European people, they have a dedicated time for holidays. They set up time to enjoy and be your out out of their own destination. Uh, they move to one place to the other to experience nature, to relax and to have fun. So when we are talking about tour tourism destination, we are referring to places where tourists to where they intend to spend their time. And this becomes a, uh, a, 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 a unique point for a facility manager because when these people live there abroad, to travel out of their place, they are looking at where they can enjoy their time. And that is where a facility manager comes in place. We must be uh, positioning ourselves to ensure that experience. We are talking about tourist definition and how it is important that a facility manager should position ourselves for giving up any tourist a good experience when they live their abroad. In recent years, tourism total contribution to global economy has become a major uh, government and nations of this world. What are the factors that affect in tra travels and tours? Travels and tours are affected by economy. How buoyant you are will determine when you want to leave your house to go on holiday. What are the political environment that you are living uh, uh, that is surrounding you? To Price of that particular property of hotel is very, very important. You look at it for function of that proposed view hotels the local. You look at the care judgment and distinct you know most of the spiritual tourism. We have sport tourism, we go for sport tourism, educational tourism, we might leave our locations and go to one location to experience and to get uh, knowledge in partition. We have invent tourism and now people are now going to space. It's, it's part and parcel of tourism. So tourism is very key in an industry if we have to understand it as a form of layer. Understanding layer we look at also what is our environment? There are some uh, sites that UNESCO has designated as world heritage. These are natural landscapes that the nature itself has carved in a manner that it's breathtaking. So people go to such sites, they look at open space, they go to designated heritage sites, to so have a feel of and experience the wonders of God. That is when we uh, that is another form of uh, uh, Leo. When we, are, when we want to understand Leo sector, we look at art museums, we look at libraries. There are so many of our painting uh, art galleries around the around the globe. Uh, so many enthusiasts of craft and arts can decide to say, let me just go to, to, to this particular art exhibition, art gallery. We have people who go to museums to have a feel of the past. This is a, 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 a mode of a layer to some people. 
We have people, their own interest is basically talking about health and fitness. Well, we have people who run gym, we have people who run a uh, uh, fitness center. Most importantly, which is also key to what we are doing, is sports and recreation. Recreation industry has provided experience for purpose of enjoyment, relaxation and health. So we have our sports stadium, we have movie theaters, we have music, music uh, venues, we have a uh, golf course, we have arcades, we have painting and batting cage and laser target arenas. We have places that we uh, uh, people can go and enjoy in their relaxation. And all these facilities are to be managed by you and FM individual. Primary function of facility manager is to ensure the facilities are attractive to users of all, of all those facilities. How do we achieve that? This is achieved by the services you render, by the management policy that is put in place, effectiveness and effective management action that has been put, provided. While Brida Kishala was making his presentation, he has highlighted a lot on these three key factors that we have, three functions that I just mentioned. Okay, when we are looking at the uh, uh, services, the uniqueness of services that you are providing must be distinct. Customer services must be the major cross of what you are doing. And this is the totality of features and characteristics of the products or services that bear on its ability to satisfy as, uh, uh, the stated and implied needs of your customer. If there is no customer satisfaction, there will be uh, there will be a lot of disharmony in this service call cost, uh, service uh, customer service. If there is a significant gap between customers' expectation and customer perception, the facility will have a service gap. If the customer expectation are higher than their perception of facility management of, of the organization, it will have a negative gap. If the customer perception matches their expectation, perception meeting expectation, then the customer can be said to have been satisfied. If their perception exceeds their expectation, our customer will be delighted. If we will have a delighted cup that we must always put in place to ensure that those who patronize the facilities that we manage must have an experience that will always bring them back to that facility. Okay, well, well, we're moving on to management tools and use uh, that are used in this sector. With policy making, for a property that is being used as a leader, we, the, the organization must put, define what are the policies that can encourage patronage. Don't forget, our focus is to always bring back our customer because of the experiences that they are going to have while in this property. We are, uh, we are under this, uh, enjoying the facilities that are being provided, ensuring that there is no gap that is negative between the perception and the uh, 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 expectation. What they perceive is not, it is not far away from their expectation. We must be able to bridge the gap. By planning, we must be able to grip, bridge the gap by managing that facility, uh, uh, our customer, uh, our patrons coming back. Two key tasks are re required. Staff should know what to do and how to do them. When you run a facility, that facility will be run by employee. Human resource management is key in this in this in this sphere to ensure proper standard 
such that we do not leave any room for, uh, for, for, for uh, any unwanted uh, gaps. Staff should know what to do without being told how, how to do it at the right time. We also must, as, as, as a facility manager, we must be able to motivate and to instill confidence in our staffs that manages this facility to carry out work willingly and effectively, uh, effectively without even being told on what to do. Okay, in this regard, we are going to quickly look uh, at organization strategic business plan. In order to manage facility efficiently and effectively, robust strategies must be developed within the context of the organization's strategic business plan. A business plan for facility management must have the following goals. Remember Dr. Akishola talked about planning, and planning is all about setting goals. Uh, scrutinizing your, your, your goal smart is your goal. Is it specific? Is it measurable? Is it actionable? Are they, are, are, are they time bound? So these are some big things that we must subject our uh, plans to. Differentiating between core and non-core business activity is a task that is crucial for all facility management, for, 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 for facility manager. We must be able to identify which of these business activities is core to this facility or to this organization and which one is not core. We must be able to identify and establish effective and manageable process for meeting those needs. Those established goals, we must establish effective and management process. A process has to be put in place. We must establish processes, appropriate resources that will meet those process to be achievable. Do we must be able to also identify fund requirement? How do we source for fund to implement the strategies and the plans that we are trying to bring to the table? A budget must be established as, a, as part of our plan for managing of this uh, facility, both for short time and uh, long time. We'll come back to that because our focus as business facility manager now in the areas of Leo must be for both short time and long term. We must establish information management uh, system for effective controls of our operation. Now, when we are looking at, there are three areas uh, that I want us to, uh, to, to uh, draw our attention to. Uh, these are in developing our facility management strategy. I want us to look at three areas. Uh, three main stages, which is strategic analysis, developing solutions, and implementation. When we are looking at the first stage, strategic uh, analysis, we must have an ass assessment of expectation of objective. Remember, we talked about setting goals. With the why you set goals, Peter Akutola also mentioned it earlier, that you just don't set goals, you review it, you uh, fine-tune it as time goes on. Those assessments is very key for a service uh, or for, for a facility manager. Okay, at this level, we must be able to uh, look at our service audits and review. While you are your, when you are analyzing your strategy, your portfolio auditing will come into place. Your resources auditing will come to play. They, they are market focus, we come into play. You must be able to analyze all this. What kind of market are you trying to serve? What kind of resources, what kind of funding is available for you to manage this resource, uh, the facility? The services and the processes that we have established, how we need to audit them often and review them uh, as uh, as soon as we establish there is a gap here to, 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 uh, that will impair negatively on the structure. Having done our analysis, we need to now begin to look at the solutions. 
we need to develop solutions to address our concerns. And this comes in place of you generate options, you look at those options, and then you select a strategy that will address those particular uh, environments. Once this is done, the next stage will be implementation. While you are implementing, what do you need? You need people, you need system. You must put the right people at the right places. You remember we said we must encourage our people to know what to do and know how to do it at the right time. If you do not have uh, a, a human resource management, a system that will encourage people to uh, uh, look at your strategic goals and as they are focused for implementation, there will be a gap. Communication is key in all this. You must do your resource planning and how do you go about your procurement. You must be able to sit down, analyze and put all these things to, in place during uh, planning and even in, during implementation. In procurement, how do you do your servicing? Are you bringing in people from outside? Or you have an in-service in -service, uh, staff that will take care of your facility. This is where the informed client function comes to bear. As a facility manager, the concept of informed client function is critical. And this is what uh, the understanding of your organization, the understanding of the core objective of the organization you are serving, comes into play. What is their culture? What, cost, what is their customer target? What is their need? You must have a full understanding of the specific nature of the services they have targeted to, 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 to serve. This is very key for us as an individual who manages facilities. So be able to address the need because in all, we must understand that customer services making those facilities much functional optimally is the key managing and implementation of our outsourcing our insourcing is also very important minimizing risk having an understanding of the risk associated with what we do as a facility manager we help us to have a good grip over our functions uh, these are the few things that i think we should look at and we are also looking at benchmarking, which also mentioned by Yoda Akishola earlier in the presentation when he talks about the issue of uh, Samsung, iPhone, trying to see, okay, what is happening in this market, what is not happening in this market. We we'll still come back to that. And the most importantly, surveying user satisfaction with our services is a task that we must continue to do often and often and often. Uh, this is very key. As a facility manager, what we do is to, fast, uh, to, to make sure that the facility that we manage are optimal, uh, operating optimally. When the life cycle of our assets is telling us that it is time to dump, I mean, to scrap that particular uh, facility, we should know what to do at the right time. And that takes us to the life cycle uh, analysis of our assets, which begins, which has basically six stages. We start with you plan to acquire your assets, you acquire, you operate, you maintain, and renew. And dispose when you discover that your, your cost of maintaining is really getting out of hands. Uh, that is for us to take as a decision when we discover that the, 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 the consumption of funds by your facility is actually taking a toll on the fund of the organization. Uh, we must also come to understand that as a facility manager, there are three key uh, areas that eat into the resources of the organization. The demand work, the preventive maintenance work, that we do often, and the future work, that's the project work. Uh, uh, like we talk, talked about short time and long time. In the long run, a, a business organization 
we look into the future and the project that by social time we have, should be adding uh, more space. Maybe we do not have uh, a swimming pool right now. Maybe we have a, 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 a space earmarked for it. We can project. Those are areas that funds will always be needed to uh, inject into uh, as we go ahead in managing that facility. Then quickly I want us to look at running out of the allotted time. We're looking at benchmarking. Benchmarking has, uh, has been touched by Bioda Kishola in his uh, open uh, paper. And this is basically looking at your in-house, what you do in-house, your own business outfits, your facility, and looking at those who, who deliver similar services like you within the industry and see what is working for them and what is not working, what is not available in your own space. So therefore we can say benchmarking is discovering the specific practice responsible for high performance, understanding how a facility uh, best practices work, adapting and applying these practices to your own organization. Well, these are key and it's very important. I said of adapting it, refining it, and applying it in your own environment. This is what is going to make you to continue to be a business when you do not have a competitive edge over your competitors. Then you will be losing customers, you will be losing patronages, and the business will not run uh, as it should be. Quickly, we look at the step that we need to take when we are conducting benchmarking of our facility. We need to we look at organizing, we look at collecting information, you need to adapt, analyze those information and then look at the result and adapting them to your own facility. If we can do these four things, you will continue to be relevant in business and then you will continue to uh, serve a wider range of audience. Like you that Kishora mentioned earlier, using an, an, uh, uh, an example of iPhone, now you see, uh, these people are in, in, in they are at rat race. You are before iPhone comes out, what was in iPhone? They said iPhone 12. Before you know it, it was iPhone 13. Before you know it, it we are currently have iPhone 4, uh, uh, 14 Pro Max. What are they doing? They were benchmarking the system and bringing new new features into that uh, product to ensure that it appeals to the, the consumers, which uh, basically continues to make them relevant within the system. So uh, I believe we, with that little win, uh, as, as position, we have been able to understand what our benchmark uh, market runs. Layoff service management, marketing is viewed. We are looking at marketing now. For a business to continue to be relevant and be in, uh, in, in, in the industry, to play its role, it is important that a uh, marketing strategy should be developed. From the beginning, at the point of planning for establishment of that organization, every business must have its focus on the target market. Which, side, which kind of services do you want to render? Who are those two and uh, uh, are your targeted audience within that service spectrum? Layer service marketing should be viewed as a continuous process rather than activities on its own. It's not going to be that it's here, yeah, we are going to carry fire, going, no. It's going to be a process that, that an activity, rather than being responsible of a specific marketing manager or a departmental thing, it is a continuous process that involves the general orientation of the entire organization spectrum towards this, the, the customer. 
Uh, yes, you take your customer, you, you take your choir, you do your advertisement, people come to your facility. How do you treat those facility patrons? Those experiences that they, they have will be part and part soon of your marketing. If you do not have a good customer relations, you will be losing customer. The effort of the marketing department will be at an uh, effort in futility. So this process is very important. And I want us to look at the components of these processes. Number one, identification and selection of your target market. This involves the identification of the group you want to serve. The group with the same similar interest that your business is pro providing and then subsequently position your organization to fit in into their needs. You must have a target market and focus on them. Number two, a major process of, is the combination of market mix variables. There are so many goals that you set at the beginning. Of your, of, of, of your project, of your facilities. These are going to incorporate into multiple uh, services that we are rendering at the same time. For example, we have a cinema, cinema hall. It is, it is not every day they use that uh, facility to hear uh, 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 cinema to customer. We see some of them being used as event uh, venue at the moment. So these mixed-use variables can come into play, focus on those essential components, and then uh, you redesign your product, your program, to ensure that you are available in the market. This is also taking us to what I call the traditional market piece, which is the product. What way are you providing? What services are you producing? What are you producing? What will you produce? What services are you rendering? Okay? So you must ensure that these are known. And when it's known, it helps you to market the products. Where will it be offered? That is the place. Will you, where is the place? That is the facilities that you are offering. Now we are looking at Leo. We are looking at the hotels. We are looking at stadiums, we are looking at the cinema halls, we are looking at places of such nature, because leisure will definitely take place in an environment. Even if it is an outdoor services, somebody must take care of that environment. That's the place. Attention must be given to that particular place. The price you are putting on your charges must also be measured commensurate to the kind of services that you are rendering. Benchmarking will also help you to know how do you package your price. And what is the available, what is the, uh, the market value? What is the appropriate market value of similar products, services that you are entering within that spectrum? That will help you to be able to put a price to it. And then jump the Doing a price breakdown analysis will also help you in this environment such that you don't just uh, put a lot of uh, profit margin on top of your prices and that, you know, prices is fundamental. It can attract and it can send your customer away. Promotion. Promotion is one of the P's and this is communication with target groups. Several additional variables, appearances. How do you impress your 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 patrons? The mood of the locations. There are some uh, environment that they said no. We don't want loud noise here because people that are coming here, we want them to be able to reflect. Okay, so they need they need a calm environment. You know, so that's part of you. You can now pr promote that environment. You can promote your service and your product, even with the appearances of your staff. You know, when, when your front desk officer is frowning and then you have issues with customer, if, if mode of communication becomes a problem, then you'll be losing
customer instead of gaining them. Okay, so we look at the P, another P is the participant, public image, the perception of people about your organization, about the services that you are rendering, and of course the political impact that uh, is prevalent in your uh, country, in your environment. Uh, above all, we must also understand that long-term strategic planning, market research, are all critical parts of marketing process. In summary, the relational service marketing process includes research, information gathering, identification of choice of target, uh, target market, manipulation of market mix variables to design and create programs that will impact positively on your organization. Uh, with this, uh, I've come to the end of the presentation as I noted. I thank you for listening. If there are any questions, I will be hanging around to uh, listen to them. Thank you. Over to you, Uncle. All right, thank you so much, um, Brother Wilson. Uh, I want to believe you have been able to give one or two things from the just. Uh, uh, let me quickly add that uh, in support of this uh, presentation, the slide, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the workshop uh, document that is given to us on this module, there is a video that is uh, packaged. Uh, as part of that uh, resource, I will. I want you to go through that video. It will give you a better, uh, a more, uh, more information on uh, the topic that we have just examined. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for the well uh, um, delivered uh, lecture. We really want to appreciate you, and I want to believe that um, we are already having um, uh, the benefit of what we are paid for. And uh, as of now, I'm sure uh, for the first two lectures we have taken, we are already getting something great. Uh, we are already having the fact that leaving our various homes to come here today is not a waste of time. I'm also sure that those that are even online. They are also with us here, and uh, I know they would have also loved to also be here physically. But based on one or two things, we understand that they could not join us. Thank you so much, Mr. Wilson, for this uh, well presented uh, paper. Thank you so much. God bless you. We appreciate that. So, um, we proceed to the, we proceed to the third uh, module, which is. Uh, the role of project management, risk management, and governance in facilities management. The facilitator is Mr. Tetene. Please let me confirm. It's online. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, thank you. Please confirm. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you clearly. You have the floor, sir. Hello, good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes, very audible. Yeah, I can hear you. I can I think it does. You switch to another person now and it's finished. Sorry, I think you. I don't know. I don't know. Some person, so I can speak clearly and I'll be correct. Is that me with me, please? Hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. You can go ahead, sir. Yes, you can hear you. Go ahead, sir. Can I 
this short course yet. So I don't know the um, approach this has um, followed up until now, but I always like to have a back and forth, like um, interactive class, you know, so we can have hands on where we share experiences, where we ask questions and get um, answers to our questions. I know there's a question section, uh, question answer section after this, but as we go on, um, feel free. Just use the raise hand, raise your hand um, button if you are following us online, or just raise your hand and let me have a minute, um, call my attention to it. So to your question, so I can take your question. Yes. So let's dive right into it. Uh, first of all, we'll look at this short video. I think this was shared with everyone. Let's just take one minute to look at it before we proceed. Let's go, please. Yes, so to keep this video is on your this video is on your course um, booklet and I believe you should have access to it. I mean please confirm the audio is is clear. You can hear the audio please. Okay, right. those doing it online, can you just drop a message on the chat box confirming that you can hear what's happening? Yeah. I can see the other you see the other two, I can see Adi Kola Robert, I can see um, Adi Bayo, I can see Patience Francis, I can see David Motwa, I can see Uche Sunday, Eric Femi Lumonio, I can see Ido Ulawa Leonard, I can see Lemuzo, I can see Mitchell. Rafael, man. Sorry if I got the pronunciation of your name wrong, but please, I need someone to confirm on the chat box that they can hear what I'm playing in the background. All right, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for that. All right, so I think it's my audio is okay. All right. You are audible, but we cannot hear the video sound. about that. I don't know if it's a general issue. If it was a general issue, I mean. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just speak through it. That's not an issue being a get audio, but I believe you have this in your hand and you can listen to it at your own 
um, at your own time. I also share this slide so you can have access to it and listen to it. Yeah. So two things stood out for me in this short video. I just, uh, well, if you want to share it, what's that for you? That's fine, you can use the chat box. So two things, the fact that Rick's is a likelihood, can be likened to like a likelihood, an uncertainty of something happening. Secondly, if something is happening already, then it is an issue, it is not a risk. So that should invariably tell you that risk has not happened yet. Yeah, so risk, your ability to foresee risk is your ability to tell what might possibly happen in the future, you know, with regards to the project that you are handling. All right, so let's, let's, let's just go, let's proceed. Okay, we'll move on to my next slide. Uh, one minute. Okay. All right. Okay. One minute. I think I want to show, I show, I show my slides. Okay. So I'm just going to share this now. All right. So the backup. So first off, why, why study projects? Why study project management? The first thing to look at is, is there a difference between facilities management? I believe that we are in facility managers here, or we're interested in the facility management industry. What is the distinguishing factor between facility management and project management? Yes, there's a difference. Facility management is routine, whilst project management is one of the project projects. A project is a temporary endeavor. It has a definite timeline. It starts at a finish time and produces a unique product, service, or a process. Yes. So look at what you do daily as a facility manager. All the, everything you do, most of the things you do, like for example, 90% of the things you do daily are things that you do continuously over time. For example, if a facility manager resumes work in the morning, the first thing he's going to do is do the facility work around. That's a routine task. I cannot be telling a project. So what now stands out as a project for a facility manager? I was able to capture some examples here. For example, example project in facility management, office relocation. For example, you want you you want to relocate your office space. For example, the company you work for is moving from looking for moving from property A to property B. That itself is a project because it's not a routine tax. There's a definite start time and there's a definite end time. Yeah, for example, today is 25th. Your company comes to you and say we want to move this office space between now and the end of the year. That makes it a project because you have a timeline to it because it's not something you're going to do continuously. You understand? You plan the project. You're going to take your time as a party manager to plan the operational location, get vendors that will help you move your work tools, get vendors that will help you disengage all your, your, your electrical and mechanical infrastructure. You get a um, Vendors that are going to help you with the logistics, and get vendors that are going to help you with the installation at the new location. This makes it a pro project. Secondly, we have a space modification or retrofit. For example, you want to renovate your office space, assign new space, create new um, office spaces. That in itself is a project. For example, you have a space shutdown. You want to shut down an office location. There are several activities that you engage as a project as a project and facility manager that is going to make the project and not a recurring tax. You have a project modification or addition. Um, or addition. For example, you want to install a new mechanical system, a new generator, for example, a new electrical system to your building. That itself in itself is a project. So this is different, this is what differentiates project management. How do you manage all of these examples of projects as a facility manager? This is what differentiates the, your project management skills from being a facility manager. I want to emphasize this now. A facility manager can be anybody. I've worked with people who studied soil sciences but are accomplished facility managers. I've worked with civil engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, builders, quantity surveyors who are facility managers. So 
Fatima, Fatima is my skill. Fatima is multidisciplinary. But there are key knowledge areas, for example, project managers, that project management that differentiates between an excellent facility manager and a facility manager that is just there. For you as a builder to excel as a facility manager, these are some of the soft, some of the skills, hard skills that you are going to need to be able to create an impact. I remember um, Dr. Akinshola mentioned something earlier. He mentioned something about um, the need to constantly develop yourself. You cannot excel as a facility manager with merely technical competence. Anybody can have technical competence. The technical competence. So electrical technician has technical competence in electrical fittings and electrical installations. Your, your AC technician has core facilities competence in AC maintenance, but you as a facility manager have, have, should have a strategic, more strategic competence level, yeah, which will be developed by some of these skills, project management, risk management, compliance, that's why you are taking this course. Yes, yeah, so we move on to the next slide, um, risks and compliance. Why are we looking at risks? Why are we looking at compliance? What is risks and what is compliance? Compliance they have to follow the laws, regulations, and other requirements that apply to business or organization. Why risks, like I explained earlier, a risk is any unexpected event that can affect your project, for better or, or for worse. This means that risks can be positive and risks can be negative. It's not all the time that risks is negative. There can be risks that will that would result into positive results or positive outcomes. Let me use that for that better word. And there are also risks that, if not well managed, will lead to business losses. So what makes the difference is how we are, 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 are able to identify with the positive risks and the negative risks. These are key skills you're going to need as a facility manager. We're going to look at the job risk assessment as a, as a case study at the end of this uh, course, at the end of this session. You know, this is a document I have used separately as a facility manager to access the risks involved in whatever tax, project activity, or even facilities, regular activities that engage the facility manager. This is a, it is, a document that we use to assess our risks and I've used to manage risks. And we'll have a look at it shortly as we go on in this course. Yes, yeah, so I think that's some of the facility mix examples. You know, we can relate this to some of those things that uh, you encounter as you carry out your job as a facility manager. You have health and safety risks. Yes, what are health and safety risks on the job you do? For example, you have somebody that wants to change the light fitting, but that wants to change the circuit breaker. What are the health and safety risks? Are you a facility manager that's concerned about the health and safety of that technician, or a facility manager that is only involved in get, that's only interested in getting the job done? I worked on an occasion where you cannot change a light fitting without a job risk assessment, duly signed by a trained health and safety advisor to that company. I worked in that company as a service provider, permanent service provider, and I couldn't change the socket without filling out the job breaks assessment for that particular socket change and getting it signed by the company, the group, it was even a group, but like getting signed by the group job breaks and um, health and safety assessor. That is how important some companies take health and safety. Health and safety. That is that was one of the key competence areas of the facility manager, your ability to manage health and safety risks. Then the um, another one is fire and disaster risks. How are you able to identify fire identify fire risk? How are you able to identify and manage disaster risks? For example, I mentioned here BCM and, and JRA. Do you know what a BCM is? A BCM is a business is a is business continuity management. Do you know how to respond in the case of a disruption when there is a disaster. How do you prepare your company to be able to respond to disaster? Can your company continue running if there's a flooding in your office today? I mean, you as a facility manager are able to advise your company on how they can better manage the facilities such that even if there is a riot, the company can continue working. Even if there's a flood, even if there's a fire hazard, the company can continue working. Yes, there are people that actually had this for some other for some other for for some 
but it's a key skill requirement required of a facility manager who will be requested to provide an input on this. There is also a security, security risk. How are you able to identify and manage security risks in your company? Does anybody have easy access to your company or to your office or to your facility? Can anybody just come in and pick up something from your from your facility? How are you able to manage your skill set in television facilities? You know, these are key, com key components of facility management, extra low voltage systems, your smoke detectors, your CCTV. Do you have a system in place to manage the risks that are involved in with regards to security? For example, a case in point is when a staff member comes to the facility office and complains that he has his laptop which he kept on his work desk got stolen. And you as a facility manager are requested to go and check the camera to see if you can identify who stole the laptop. Will you at that point be the kind of a facility manager that will go to the CCTV decoder? and check and discover that, yes, there is actually a theft, but the CCTV was not recording at that particular point. Or you're going to be a facility manager that will go and check and discover that, yes, we have, we have video recordings of that particular day, and we can identify who stole the laptop. You are supposed to be the kind of facility manager that can do that for the company. How do you manage some of these recordings? These are key points that you need to take note. In the technology of we have environmental risks and hazards. What are key environmental risks? Your business, we talk about is ASG, environmental social and governance, you know, sustainability. How are we able to advise your company to be more sustainable, to be more responsible in society? That's all things that you're going to be responsible for as a facility manager. Then regulatory compliance risks, and you know, facility compliance to regulatory requirements or you're just doing your job as a layman. You know, don't eat the legacy government is coming to your facility today, they are going to raise issues with uh, regulation, they're going to raise issues with how you're managing your wastewater, how you're managing your soil waste. You know, these are key things you need to look at as a facility manager and manage also. Then I also then we'll move on to the next thing. Next topic, um, the rules of project management in facilities management. They look at the key knowledge areas. Yes, when you look at your handbook, you see a list of nine rules of project management and facility management. You have a long list there. I'll just be able to match this into what is the industry best practice. Yes, so there's a body that manages project management in the whole world as a whole that satisfies project management. It's the Bright Project Management Institute. So they looked at the project management practice and identified 10 key knowledge areas. These are key knowledge areas that every project manager should be able to understand and manage successfully for proper project management. The first one is integration management. This basically details how a, a project manager, and in this case a facility manager, must have a strategic view of the entire project. When I use strategic view, I mean an awesome view, a management view, not the operational view. There are three levels of management. They have the strategic, they have the tactical, they have the operation. If a facility manager is supposed to work at a strategic level, yes, let me that again. There are three levels of management. The strategic, the, the tactical, and operational. What information management means is that project manager, and in this case, the first manager must be able to understand the value of a project at the strategic level, the highest level of management. He needs to understand why management is taking on this project and what management needs to achieve. The end point. Yes, we are not just supposed to look at the operational level, the tax for giving. Management is saying that I should move from diesel generator to um, a more hybrid power solution, for example. I even be the passive manager that just know, oh yes, they say we should use solar, they say we should use hybrid, or even the passive manager that know why the organization is saying she migrate from just the traditional power generation to a more hybrid solution. Yeah, you need to be a passive manager that has that strategic view. Then also, the passive manager needs to be able to align projects with strategic objectives of the stakeholders. What are your stakeholders? Your stakeholders are 
internal and external to you, how does this project affect each of the stakeholders, and how can you manage the project so that each of the stakeholders in the teams are met? The next one is scope management. This entails how a facilitator is able to plan the scope, deliverables, and milestones. Do you understand the whole scope of your project, or do you just understand the end result? Your project manager is supposed to be able to understand the tax as a whole, the scope, the full scope of the project, and break down this scope into deliverables and milestones so that you can act properly manage the project. Next one is schedule management, which has to be timeline. Can we use the knowledge you are able to get from the school? Can you divide these activities, assigning timelines to them so that you are able to properly monitor each of each task together with a timeline and also at the end of the project see how you manage the project from start to finish? Were you able to meet your, your timelines or were you not able to meet your timelines? The next one is cost management. How are you able to budget? And how are you able to estimate and also control your cost? You know, these are necessary skills you need to have as a facility manager. Uh, during the ethical form, we look at budget and we have to manage how to budget for a facility cost. You know, we look at how you can budget for different techniques for budgeting your hard services and your, your soft services. We look at how to also control um, your cost at the end of the day and how to use um, some methods to measure how you perform at the end of the day in regards to cost. The next one is quality management. A facility manager must be able to ensure that the project meets specification and user requirement. This is a key soft skill, or what is a soft skill, because the ability to communicate and collect requirements is an essential soft skill. You need to understand what the person needs in terms of requirements. You know, what you need, collect the requirements you can meet it. Because if you don't understand what they need, how are you going to be able to meet the user requirements? Secondly, you need to be able to uh, comply with industry best practices by understanding and which of projects meets industry best practices. You need to be able to apply corrective actions when necessary or under quality management. You need to understand how you can measure the quality of your works using these requirements and how you can also apply corrective actions when necessary. Then another knowledge area is the resource management. A facility manager needs to be able to allocate resources efficiently. Imagine we are a facility manager like I was, I was a facility manager managing facilities for a tier one county in the middle of the state. We had about 24 branches in the middle of the state, for example. How am I able to manage resources amongst these 24 branches? For example, I cannot be in all the branches at the same time because for the state is a large state. How can I be at a different time and be at Okay, for example, I have a vendor working for me in the I have a vendor working for me in the city. How can I manage both vendors at the same time? How can I allocate my time? Is that what? Sorry, I think that was. Somebody interrupted me. I don't know if you have a question. But I'll go ahead. So, how can you manage your, your, resource, your resources and things, your material, your personnel, your equipment, so that you have no deficiencies and you ensure project success? The communication management, how are you able to communicate efficiently? Your stakeholders, you know, how, how are you able to reach out to them to meet their needs, you know, collect their requirements, you know, and give them feedback when you completed the project? Then, risk management, are you able to identify and manage risks and ensure regulatory compliance, you know, for whichever client you serve? Then, procurement management, how do you coordinate external service providers? You know? Because procurement is essential to your, your success as a facility manager. Are you able to manage the procurement process end to end so that there are no lapses at any point in time? There's stakeholder management. You have stakeholders. There's another soft skills. Soft skill, just like the architect just like Shala mentioned. Are you able to actually manage your stakeholders? Both internal and external external stakeholders need to determine if they are going to be successful as a facility manager. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Um, the internet is back. Um, 
Okay. All right, so my slide is back on. I'll just put this in the table also. Uh, <laughs> this, the, my next slide, I'm going to look at the framework for managing risk and compliance. How are you able to manage your risks? How what process do you follow to manage risks? What framework are you to follow to effectively manage risks? So there are five steps in the risk management framework. This is just a, a summary view of what you have in your handbook. You have to identify, analyze, outside priority, mitigate, and monitor, monitor and review. So the first step is identify your risk. This is the, the most important stage in this framework, the most important stage of having to properly identify what risks apply to your individual pro yeah, project. You need to you need to, to identify applicable regulations and guidelines. You need to identify potential risks. This may include building codes, fire safety regulations, environmental regulations, and professional health and safety guidelines. You need to analyze your risks. You need to copy to conduct the compliance study. We need to assess, assess the probability of each risk occurring. We need to assess potential impact of each risk uh, on your project. This analysis needs to be done on site. You cannot analyze your risks identified even from your site. You need to look at, at how possible this risk can happen. How about the possibility, probability? Is it a high probability or is it a low probability? So this place you need to be on site to be able to identify the individual tax. So you need to determine the probability of each of these um, risks and um, crystallizing. The next activity is assign priority. After you analyze your risks, you need to be able to assign priority to each of your risks. You need to be able to determine if it is high, medium, or low priority. You know if you're able to identify if your risk is high, medium, or low, you're going to be able to determine what you're going to do to mitigate the risk. Then we take us to the next step, which is mitigate. You need to be able to choose whether you're going to accept, whether you're going to reduce, whether you're going to reject, or whether you're going to transfer your risk. You can do this by making these couch changes to the facility, updating policy and procedures, and providing training to staff. Then the last stage is monitor and review. This would entail regular inspections and reviewing incident reports, then updating mix assessment as necessary. Going on to the next slide. How do you mitigate your risks? There are four stages or four steps in mitigating risks. Either you accept, either you avoid, either you transfer, or either you reduce your risks. And I've identified your decision criteria in there. For which you need to accept. We accept only risks that have a low chance of occurrence. After you analyze your risks at the next stage and you identify the priority, you you need to decide whether you're going to accept the risks, avoid, reduce, or transfer. So you accept risks that have a low chance of occurrence. You avoid risks that have a high can. chance of occurrence. You reduce risks that have a low to high chance of occurrence, and you transfer risks that have a low to high chance of occurrence. Transferring risks here is by either insuring your project or outsourcing your project. You can insure your project. There's um, what we call an advanced payment board or uh, advanced, advanced performance board. You know, which insures provides some protection in case that the project is then goes through as planned. Then you can also outsource the project, which helps you as a person whether transfer your risk to another company. You understand? The third party service provider, you just transfer your risk and tell them to manage this project, whatever risk will come as a result of that project. Then, uh, in conclusion, we'll look at a sample job risk assessment for a small project. This is just a very minor project. One of the things that you're going to do as a facility manager. We're going to look at the job risk assessment for a for periodic air conditioner servicing activity. So I have a workbook here which I'll open. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me open the workbook. Yeah, one minute please. I, I need. Yes, I'm almost done. I need two minutes to go through this. Okay.
Yes. So what we need, I'm going to open and share my screen from the sample job risk assessments. Zoom is really advanced. Yes. So what we need to do? Yeah, it is easy. Very well. What we need to do is to do that. Okay, please. Can you see my screen? Can anyone see the work I'm sharing? Please, I need, I need feedback on the no, chat box. No, no, no. Okay. Huh? You can see it now. Please, someone should drop the chat for me. Can you see the work I'm sharing? You can see it now. You can see it. Alright, awesome. Yes, so this is, yes. this, yeah, all right, so this is a template I've used to access my lyrics on all the slides I've worked on. <laughs> Just give me a summary view and for all these purposes, because if you're working in, a, a, for example, a corporate or a government organization, you are aware that there are some regulatory audits that I come mostly about to audit your job as a corporate manager. And this is one of the documents that is going to ask of you, uh, not exactly a document, they're going to ask you how you manage your risks in regards to your projects and your activities as a facility manager. Yeah, so this is a data assessment form. It's pretty much automated for me, but it's something that anyone can do. Yeah, so you can see here the activity of distribution, distribution of my tags. Look at where I'm pointing. Let me, let me see if I can. Please confirm your back with me. I'm going to enlarge my screen so everyone can see my screen. Is it better now? Any confirmation that it's better now, please? Is my screen better now? Or is it too large? Can everyone see my screen? Any confirmation, please? Is my screen, my workbook legible enough? Okay, it's better now. Okay. Thank you, David. Let me just confirm to you that my screen is that my workbook is. More legible now. So, this is this, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a risk assessment is a workbook I use to assess my risk. So, as I mentioned on this slide, this is the risk assessment for a very simple activity, a conditional servicing. So, I'm going to close this open now. Before I go into it, can someone tell me some of the activities for a simple split unit? A simple split unit. I need someone to commute and tell me three activities that are involved in such simple, simple split units. Easy. Okay. Yes, I need someone to omit and tell me some split activities that are involved in something this simple split unit of information. We are going to use that information to do our risk assessment for this activity, for this project. Because it's a project, you don't service your air conditioners habitually. You don't service them like every day. It's not like a continuous project. It's a, it's a project because it's done, it has a timeline and it is done periodically. For example, I service with ECs quarterly. You know, I have a one week timeline to service around about um, 56 units. And Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, right, right, right. Please speak, please. Tell your name. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Jimon Howard. Hi, Jimon. Hi, Jimon. Is that possible? Uh, in servicing of a uh, unit, definitely you have to uh, dismantle the indoor okay. for you to be able to wash the filter, to wash the, all the, uh, the fan. So you need to remove it. And for you to remove it, which means if it is uh, at the high level, you need a ladder. And for you to climb a ladder to the series there, so those yes. are it is done. Okay. okay. All right. Awesome. That's very awesome. Thank you very much. In fact, you answered my question um, about the options of things that are very critical to the activity. So, yes. So I broke this down into three, three simple activities, assuming that I 
um, taking into consideration what Jim mentioned. So, first one, and it is marking the units. Some say that steam wash, then just works. Yes. So, the first thing to do in assessing the leaks, just like I mentioned, is look at your project and identify the leaks involved. How we identify the leaks if you don't know the activities? Of the project. So that's what I've done here is so I the activities involved in your project. Break down your project into bits. Break down your task, your activity into smaller bits, into smaller activities. That way you can identify the risks involved in each of these smaller activities. So look at the first point here, the smartly unit. What are the hazards here? The risk hazard is going to be exposed wiring, sharp edges, and falls from height. Yes, that's what that's what the thing Jimon mentioned. It's a height with a ladder. And the big involved in that is somebody that is not using the body harness, for example, can fall from that height. Somebody that if there's an exposed wiring that the person does not know this, that is exposed and alive, you 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 would discover that the person gets shot and can fall. So what are the effects? The effects are electric shocks, cuts, and uh, electric shocks and cuts. Sorry, this last point is not supposed to be here. Yes, this last one. I showed you some but that's means it's supposed to be in the risk control process. I'm not going to move that now. So we don't get confused. Yes. So what are the risks? So that's false. Yes, what are the risks involved? The effect of being exposed to a light um, exposed wire, electric shocks. What are the um, effects of being exposed to a sharp edge? For example, the AC. If you, you, you work with outdoor units, you discover that there are some sharp edges that if someone is not concerned, he is not careful, and doesn't use a glove, you discover that the person gets caught, you discover that it's a lot, then those that the effect, then fall from heights. If the person is not using body harness and not using an air ladder, it's called a person can fall from height if the person gets shot or is caught or is involved in all skating. So what I do, what we do here is we assign a probability factor to each of these um, each of these um, activity and this and the risks. The probability means what is the likelihood that this will happen. Look at the probability factors. Either it's very remote. Very remote, that is, it might never happen. Unlikely, that means it's the very low likelihood. Probable means it might happen, it's probable. Highly probable means happening, then certain means it will definitely happen. So, so I put six here as quality that this can happen. It is probable, this is probable. It's probable and can avoid it. Then, S here means severity. Severity means if it happens, if this risk, number one means no injury or incident as stated. Four, there might be minor, minor first aid injury. For example, if there's a cut or bruise, then either year six means there's going to be need for medical um, intervention. Eight means um, lost time, severe bone and broken broken bones. Then ten fatality and loss of limbs. Limbs. To be on the same side, I assign a severity level of eight to each to this particular mix involved in this activity, this marketing unit. So I assign the mix control slash mix control control measure, which is first the use PPE, you ensure proper loto loto. What loto means is lockout tag out, lockout tag out. What this means is, if, for example, we are servicing, servicing 50, um, 20 units in a particular building, these 20 units are connected to a particular distribution board. It doesn't make sense, health and safety why they are not going to be compliant if they are going to be working on an AC that is not turned off from the distribution board, not from the light socket, because if they are going to turn off an AC from the lights, lights um, from the uh, switch. What if you are working outside and somebody goes there mistakenly to switch on the switch while you are working on the fan, you are turning the fan outside. That means the fan kicks 
and we have a severe cut. We are wounded, and that's the risk that we don't want to have injuries to your personnel. So what we do, what local partner means is, before you work on any electrical appliance, for example, in this case, an AC, you need to lock out that AC using it. Um, and equipment known as a lockout tagout equipment. It has a lock, a small lock, which is adapted to work with your distribution board switches, and that a a label which you can use to label the lock that is locked out. So, for example, it has a small padlock that comes with the apparatus. Um, there's a way distribution boards are designed such that you can actually close the distribution board and lock it so that nobody can go to the distribution board or that particular circuit and switch it back on while you're still working on that unit. Because in, in this case, you have locked in that lock and you hold the key. So when you're done with the project, then you now go back and open the distribution board, or open the circuit and switch on the unit. This is just to take out any possibility of um, somebody going and switch on the unit, thinking that, oh, someone switch it off is taken. Then another risk control measure I explained here is to ensure use of the proper A ladder. So the residual risk, risk here means that after I've applied this risk control, are there still going to be residual risks? Yes, possible. So is this is green now because I have applied these measures, these control measures, which will now reduce the, both the possibility, probability and the severity of my risk. So now this has come down from six to two in this case, and this has come down from eight, the severity has come down from eight to two also in this case. So this means two. Two probability means it's unlikely to happen, that is very, very unlikely. Sorry, let me expand this. Yes. So let me go here. Yes. Yes. So look at this, look at this matrix. Shows the, just shows those that are allowable, those that, those which you can accept and those you want to transfer or look for that measure to mitigate and those you want to avoid totally. Those in green, when you have both the possibility and severity that is in the green, that means these are risks that you can you can manage and you can accept the risk that you want to look for a means to ask, to manage on site. But when you have a risk that is on the red here, yeah, these are risks that you want to entirely avoid. So you can see now, before we applied our control measures, we have our possibility, our initial risk on red, 48. That means we needed to apply control measures. Then after applying our control measures, our possibility and severity came into the green zone, which means that yes, we can accept this risk and it's easy for us to manage. So we have Y here, which means that yes, we can accept our risk and what are the actions required? We need to ensure proper inspections are checked here, yeah, we need to ensure trained personnel that it works and ensure um, lockouts, flag out. So just someone will make sure. So this you I, you will do this for any of the activity identified. The search and steam wash, electric shops and courts, injury to personnel, fire, then ensure lockout tag outs. Yes. Once you lock that tag out you dismount your equipment, the only risk there is caught, then you can manage your court by using PPE. What is PPE? PPE, personal red, preventive, um, protective equipment to protect you from work, then closed work. Uh, the big thing of here is poor housekeeping. You know, this is also something critical to have in mind. After works, make sure your workmen keep their environment clean and they do a proper job in this assembly their, their units, their work, the AC. It's called that some people, after doing their servicing, they don't they assemble the units properly, which can also result in damage to the assets and um, um, unsafe condition. For example, I've seen an AC unit fall down after being inserted because it's not properly fixed. You know, you need these are things you need to look out for as a facility manager and make sure that these are, are properly managed. What this assessment form will do for you is that it will help you check step by step. 
your compliance. Make sure you are compliant and make sure at each step of the way you have something to go and check, like a checklist, make sure that yes, I've done this, yes, I've done this, and yes, I've done this. They have something to fall back on when there are issues at the end of the day. If you are working with contractors, this is a form you can use to own and responsible for whatever works. For example, a contractor puts somebody to site and does not uh, provide PPE for the site, and you see both of you signed up on this form. You can use this to hold the co contractor legally liable for that infraction. The contractor cannot come and tell you that, yes, it is on your site, so you should be responsible for, for example, if a staff, a staff member dies while executing work, this form or this document can save you from whatever loss that might come or whatever liability that you might be responsible for if the contractor does not execute their work safely or in compliance with safety standards. So this will save you a whole lot if you pay attention to risks, pay attention to compliance, and manage your projects in such a way that um, there are no zero risks to yourself as a facility manager and zero risks to the clients that you serve. Yes, so I'm going to stop presenting here. And I think that's the end of my presentation. And I'm going to allow for uh, questions if this is the right time for that. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. And I don't know how we will make. This is the right time for questions. I'm open to answer questions and for the team. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Tyson. Thank you so much. Months after the workshop, we will still interact with the candidates to train them on some other areas. So if you felt that you needed information on risk assessment templates, we will provide it and post it on the general platform where you can assess it and find how it is being done. Eh? The software. Yes, there are two software the, that you have to download. And with those two software, um, if you cannot install it now, you, the person who will teach you on Friday will take you, take you through installation. Teach you here, and he is coming on Thursday evening, so as to be available on Friday morning to take you through the Camera in the commission, you mutin focus that you can focus in the camera in. Okay. We should be taking our lunch now. Okay. That's it. Then we have answered questions. If you have discussion issues you want to bring up, you can bring it up, uh, maybe in your place of work, in your line of duty. There is an issue you want to raise for interaction among participants. You are very free to raise it at this point. Let's go find and see what we can do together before we move into the second phase. The second phase, I think Dr. Ali will show you a will be taking us on the next lecture after uh, lunch and discussion. Did any one of us have an uh, issue that we want to raise or bring up? No. Okay, one at the time. Enjoy, enjoy your food then. Eh? After food, we will do the necessary online. Any question from the online members? Yeah. 
The scale used in risk assessment, most importantly when it is two-dimensional assessment, that is likelihood or probability, okay, is a measure. We use those words in Tashinibi. Okay, probability of risk occurring or likelihood of risk occurring. Okay, and we also, the second dimension to risk assessment is impact if it occurs. Okay, that impact too, you can also use some similar words like consequence, severity. Are you getting me? And in some cases, we use, some people use effect. But I will not align with that word effect, okay? Because it is somehow mild, it is not as strong as the a, a second dimension of probabilities. A, a consequence, impact, and what have you. However, it depends on you. There are some assessors that will limit their scale to three. Low, medium and high. Okay? If you like, you can extend it to five. Very low, low, medium, high, very high. If you like, you can extend it to seven, depend on what you want to measure. Is that clear? Thank you. We will go into the next item on our training schedule. And I think it's of security, are we? 
Yes. It's our security issues. It is to be handled by no other person than Dr. Aliu Shunibe. Uh, Dr. Aliu Shunibe is a foremost uh, lecturer at the University of Lagos. He been in teaching profession for over 20, 25 years and has a very wide experience in the field of the facility management, notably among security. So he is more competent, if not most, to handle this topic. Here present physically and those uh, online. And uh, let me also add that uh, no one knows it all. So we are all in the business together. I will just share my little experience with you. And uh, it's going to be an uh, interactive session where, as you are learning from me, I'm equally ready to learn from you so that we can make the whole uh, interaction a robust one. So the lecture this afternoon focuses on fundamentals of security management. So the outline of the lecture is as projected above. We will quickly go through the concept of security, why security management in facilities, security management system, protecting the facilities, classes of barriers, intelligence, which is an aspect of knowledge management in security, and also security in the future, as they are applicable to those of us who are facilities managers. Concept of security, before you can go through the concept of security as it relates to facilities management. I believe it is essential, okay? That is to say, each and every one of us here attach, attaches premium, high premium to issue of security as an individual at our homes in whatever thing we want to do. So security is a very, very critical aspect in the human life. So security may be considered as the provision of uh, paid services in preventing desirable, unauthorized, or detrimental loss to an organization or individual's assets. That is, security can be looked from individual angle and it can also be looked from corporate uh, angles. Security deals with malicious acts such as sabotage, arson, and terrorism. The major goal of security is protection of assets. The assets can be in terms of material. Our lives also is a form of assets to each and every one of us. And uh, let me also quickly emphasize here that the scope of facilities management is expanding day in, day out. Okay? There are some facilities managers that do not have anything that do not have anything to do with issue of security when it comes to their scope of service. As I told you earlier, as a facilities manager, you must try to you are not in the business to have problems. If you are in the business to add value to the operations of your clients, of your clients. Okay, so you should be at the forefront of coming up with initiatives that will enhance the performance of that organization, which security is also a very, very important aspect that must be taken care of. Why security management in facilities? There is reduction in provision of security services by the government. Though it is clearly stated in our constitution that it is the responsibility of the government 
to ensure security of the lives and property of individual and corporate entities in any country. But however, we can all see that government has failed in an attempt to secure our lives and property. So it is our responsibility to ensure that we do that. There is also general increase in fear of crime. Yes, crime rate now is on the increase. Crime rate is on the increase. So on that ground, it is all of on us also to be abreast or to take care of our security. Then transfer of non corporate security tax to the private sector. We can all feel that. Then growing value and portability of assets requiring more security. Yes, we keep on coming up with assets that are capital intensive. Okay, so in that wise, we should be able to provide security to that. Then security management systems. This is just a model or a framework put in place, okay, which underpins the organizational approach to security. This security management framework has to align with the policy of every organization. So a robust security management framework enhancing a robust security management framework enhancing the business capability and credibility of the organization. Then security management procedures. What are those things we do day in, day out in ensuring that facilities are secured? These are broadly categorized into two routine security procedures and non-routine security procedures. These routine security procedures are what we do on a regular basis, okay? Why non-routine are what we do occasionally, periodically, when the need arises. So these are few uh, routine security procedures that should be put in place as regards facilities management. That is, they are duties of security personnel. For instance, access control key issues, patrols, loss and found property, and so on. Processing of security incidents. For example, trespass, theft, vandalism, suspect items, sabotage, assault, and personnel. We must process this information and communicate to the channels, to the appropriate channels. Arrest procedures and search procedures. These are regular things we do. Then use of firearms and other security equipment, if necessary. Correct handling of information, most especially classified and sensitive information. Request from the media, yes. For instance, if there are issues as regards security in, uh, as applied to corporate entities, there may be requests from the media. We should also be abreast in the on how to handle that. The medical emergency procedures, when there is such, the non-routine security procedures, few of them are also highlighted. Building evacuation plans, that is when we have emergency, when we have any form of a crisis, for instance, fire, bomb threats, industrial accidents. Okay, this do not, this, this activity doesn't happen on a regular basis. Okay? The establishment and duties of an emergency control team that is called out lists, roles, and responsibilities and duties. For instance, there may be occasions when there are cases of security threats that the in-house security team cannot be able to handle it alone. So, there may be need to reach out to the nearby police stations, okay, for a kind of reinforcement against such kind of uh, threats. Bomb threat strategy, industrial accidents, mutual aid programs, civil disturbance, for instance, in the event of riots, demonstrations, picket team, and what have you, and also industrial actions. 
security management principles. Few of these security management principles are helpful in, a, in guarantee secured facilities. One, informed. That is, must have correct data, information, and intelligence on which to base its action on. That is, any security management principles must have correct data. Okay, as security is concerned, it deals with information and data. So, data management is key to a secure uh, facility. Directed, must have clear direction as to what is required of that security arrangement. Independent, so the security entity must be independent of the line management hierarchy to ensure that it functions properly, okay? There must be little or no interference with the security department. Acceptable, security must be financially, socially, and ethically, ethically acceptable. Security is cost intensive. It is we shouldn't wait until uh, there are uh, issues of insecurity before we respond proactively to security. It's just to align with the saying that uh, uh, Pennywise pounds uh, foolish. Okay, we should invest in security. Then cooperative. That is, must have cooperation of other internal and external agencies. Yes, that is, as uh, security is concerned, for instance, in an establishment or a fair, there are workers ranging from the management to non-management staff. Okay, everybody within that organization must cooperate. That is, if you see something, say something. And you should also extend such cooperation to your neighbors, okay? Because they can also provide valuable uh, assistance or information as regards uh, any form of security threats. Monitors, yes. The monitoring and the controlling is a very, very, a very, very key to security management. As we have been repeating earlier, performance is key in whatever thing we do. Okay? As regards to security management, there will be need to appraise or evaluate the performance of whatever security framework you have uh, in place. In doing that, it must be monitored and controlled. Okay? Controlling is just to see if what you plan for is actually actually went the way it is planned or not. If it doesn't go the way it was planned, what are the causes? Okay, so this can be properly taken care of. Consistency is also very important. Then security management principle continued. Unpredictable. When, how, and where security operations will be conducted must be random. Predictability reduces the effectiveness of the security operations. Also, finally, appreciated. Security initiatives must be pressed upon all staff to secure their significance, is, uh, to ensure that their significance is embraced. Okay. Everybody must appreciate the essence of the security. Then security risk management, yes. I'm happy that uh, my brother Moses Etienne has uh, spent time to discuss with us what risk management is, okay? In risk management, okay, there's an aspect of risk management that is somehow, risk management is so wide. Okay, anything that will affect your business negatively is regarded to as risk. So that is when you are identifying risk, you must also bear in mind that there are security risks. Okay, in addition to other risks that have been identified. So on that note, we can also deploy some of these techniques 
as regards risk management to other project parameters such as cost, time, and what are due to also security. So, security risk management is a unique subset of risk management. Security risk management integrates threat assessment, criticality assessment, and vulnerability. So, let's quickly go through the security risk management process. And this is not different from what uh, Mr. Moses ATN has shared with us, but the only addition there is the context. Okay? Yes, before you go into uh, security risk management uh, process or security risk management exercise, you must define the context. What is the scope of security management? Okay? This must be clearly uh, stated the boundaries and the requirements. So after that, other procedures are the same as regards what uh, Mr. Moses HN has shared with us, that is risk identification. You should be able to identify risk. You look inwards, and this can be done using any of the risk identification techniques. Okay, it can be brainstorming. That is, you invite stakeholders who can offer valuable information as regards risk, and you all sit down and identify the possible uh, security risk. From there, risk assessment. That means you must quantify the risk, okay, using the same parameters, probability, impact assessment, or what we call likelihood and consequences uh, assessment. Then you also need to respond to the risk. How do you handle the risk? Okay. It's either you reduce the risk based on the probability measures, you also uh, transfer the risk. But remember that when you are transferring risk, it is at a, at a cost okay, to that organization. Okay? So you can also avoid the risk and you can also redistribute the risk based on the risk uh, value. Then after that, you now keep on to monitor the risk and control the risk. Okay? When you have put everything in place, you have to continue monitoring to see that the measures, okay, or the strategies put in place to mitigate the risk actually work as a plan. And last but not the least is communication. Communication is coming last on this, it does not mean that it is the last on the list. At every of these stages, you must communicate. Is that clear? Yes. For you to do justice to context of risk management, you must communicate with people to have valuable information. After identification of risk, you must communicate. Okay? At each of these stages, you must communicate. Crime prevention through design. Crime prevention through design. These are things we must do with our design in ensuring that crime is prevented or reduced to the barest uh, minimum. One of these is natural access control. So what do we do under this natural access control? They include clearly marked borders single restricted end, and uh, statements like uh, this could not to define transitional zones, which also act as a psychological deterrence barrier, okay? When you limit the assets into your facilities, that has formed a kind of deterrent to whoever is coming or to whoever is posing a security threat. We also have natural surveillance. Natural surveillance, example of it is office windows and decks toward entry points. Okay? As we are out here now, we are, well, if this is an office space, the best arrangement is that we should be able to arrange the workstations in a such way that at least majority of the users of this office 
face the entrance, okay? Why some also face the windows? So when the invaders see that, okay, people are watching, people are really looking into the direction, you may not be conscious to say you are looking there, but for that singular reason, on the arrangement of the uh, users of the office, it will scare them from doing something uh, bad. We also have territorial enforcement. For instance, spaces to reduce the possibility of illegal entry. Yes. Avoid situations where people or unwanted guests into your premises. Then, quality management. This ensure the user's uh, feelings of uh, safety, okay? That is to say, we should avoid changing the use of uh, our spaces, okay? We want to be consistent with what we use our spaces for. Then proper lighting is also very key in reducing uh, uh, crime or preventing crime. Protecting the facilities. These are few strategies we can put in place in uh, protecting facility or facilities. Security risk management. That is a robust security risk management is key in ensuring that our facilities are protected. Information system and communication protection, yes. When we say security, it is not only attributed to physical things, okay? For instance, information is more abstract. We should also go extra way in ensuring that the information and communication systems are well uh, protected. The physical and the environmental security, yes. There could be layers of security uh, measures in terms of physical and uh, environmental uh, security. Then personnel uh, security. Ensure that personnel better to use and maintain the facility systems, including third parties such as vendors and service personnel. So all these are measures uh, in protecting facility, the continuity of operation, and also security awareness. Then classes of barriers. These are few uh, barrier measures that can deter uh, any unwanted uh, guests from the into the facility. For instance, psychological barriers. Psychological barrier, for instance, if someone has the intention of uh, uh, committing crime in the environment and the person cites CCTV camera, he will be conscious it's a kind of psychological barrier. Okay? So in most cases, we should not, though we can have hidden cameras, okay? But sometimes we should expose our camera, let them see it. Once they see it, okay, those that are timid, eh, we not dare to do anything. However, we can also hide some cameras for those that are hiding criminals. Then we also have electronic barriers. Yes, electronic barriers are also similar to psychological barriers. But these are technology barriers, they include optical and infrared beams, and so on and so forth. We also have physical barriers. These can come in the form of fences, walls, shutters, locks of all forms, and safes and security cabinets. Okay, yes. I normally do that in my office. Yes, I normally do that in my office. My sensitive documents, you can't see them flying on my table. Okay, I put it in my security safe and lock it. Even my door, if I'm going to the toilet, 
I don't just lock my wooden door. I even lock my burglar the grill. Okay? So these are physical barriers. So someone who is not hardy, okay, when he sees that resistance that, okay, before I penetrate into this office, I have to break the burglary, okay, before breaking the, the wooden door and so on, so he will be scared. So these security barriers are necessary. We also have procedural barriers. That, see, in having access to a premise, maybe you need to pass through two, two, three sheds. Are you getting me? So when you put that in place, it will deter whoever doesn't have something good to do in your premises to go away. Intelligence. Intelligence is very, very key to security management. It falls under what we call knowledge management. Okay? The, for security management to be effective, there must be intelligence gathering. Okay? Yes, so organizations try as much as possible that they are security men. They, they recruit security men that can speak more than one language. Is that clear? Because some people, by the time they see you, they know that this is an outside man. He cannot speak Yoruba. And they will be in your premises and they will be communicating, interacting in Yoruba. Having in, uh, uh, believing that that person they have seen is an evil man, he cannot speak Yoruba. So we should as well do that. Yes. For, for well known countries, Okay, for instance, if you have any issue at the arrival point, entry point in some countries, even if your language is Oku language, they will find someone, okay, that can speak Oku language. Ethic, they will get someone. Depending on frequency of those that speak that language into their country. So intelligence is very key. So these are the outlines of intelligence cycle. Intelligence is not a one-off exercise, okay? It should be a continuous one, a continuous one. So what are these elements under intelligence cycle? Direction and planning of activity, collection and gathering of data and information, Processing of data and information, analysis of the information and data collect, collect, collected to produce meaningful intelligence uh, uh, reports, and also dissemination of intelligence reports to stakeholders that are necessary, and also feedback to intelligent producers on quality of intelligence uh, gathering. Security in the future. Yes, security is very key to survival to survival of uh, any organization. Okay, so in that view, what are those things that will be emerging in the future? Security in the future is expected to be transformed through innovations in security technologies, among which are defense technologies as a future indicator. That is, as security threats are identified, there will be a defense mechanisms in terms of technology in implementing such threats. We also have mobile devices. Yes, mobile devices in the sense that as you are moving, okay, with your mobile devices, okay, whatever security threats around you, okay, or in your place of work, you can equally monitor, monitor it. That is also similar to smartphones. There are people who, wherever they are, they can monitor what happens in their, in their organization or in their respective homes. Then future data assets. Yes, the world is changing there will be availability and access to robust data as regards uh, security. Then robotic devices, 
Yes. Robots will replace women. No doubt about that. Okay? There will be a time we call where you will see human beings as security officers. You will be seeing the robots. We can see a demonstration of that in Dubai where one of the priests was moving. Instead of security men guiding him, it was robots that was moving with him. Then control applications will also drive. We, we also have smart facility plant and equipment. Yes, that is to say, most of our equipment in our premises will be smart enough to be able to signal us when there is a likelihood of a threat. Then integrated and intelligent systems, smart sensors, acoustic surveillance sensors will also drive, and the smart barriers will also be a thing of uh, future. This is the video link. If we have time, we can also we can watch it. In conclusion, security has a critical role in the performance of an organization and should be given premium consideration for its future direction and trends. The futures of security can be determined by a number of trends or predictions according to what we experience now and in the past. Thank you for listening. Uh, under what classification of barrier? Under what classification? Security can be of class uh, barrier. Barrier. Can, barrier. Yes. Can we classify use of a Asian dog or snake as a security? Because we have some Fuji, one of the popular Fuji musicians. is using a Python. He has a Python in that and it's a form of security. Under what classification? That's number one. Question number two, as a facility manager. Will not be ridiculous, or how can one introduce a broom? A what? Broom, broom, broom. Yeah, I said, look, I said, look out. Some of the security. We have a round a front of the office. And honestly, one of those days when it worked, and it was still still original, it worked. You had some uh, initial information on the way. I want you to enlighten me more on that. Yes, you are very, you, you are very right. And I will share to you few cases with us here, yes. For instance, I've seen people harboring wild animals in their houses. Even he said snake, I've seen a house with a lion. Yes. Yeah. So that is that. So the you know it is in two ways. Some snakes have been uh, what do they call it? They have rendered them uh, dangerous, uh, they don't pretend any form of danger. Okay, they cannot even bite. Even when they bite, it is not, it will be poisonous. Okay, that is that. Then the lion also. Okay, that is that. Then the case I want to share has to do with Amcon. We, in recent times, Amcon seized some properties. Okay, because of the nature of the owners of those properties. Hmm? Amcon didn't use, for some properties, they did not use our official securities. They used OPC. Yes, they used OPC. So, I have a cause to approach them to pick few items from inside I was managing when that size was uh, locked up by AMCO. So after listening to my request, they just asked me to wait. And the man made some incantations, OK? Yes, made some incantations. He brought out some things and he was doing that. So for some time after that, he said, well, I can now go in and pick what I wanted to pick. So, whatever thing we can use to secure ourselves, provided it works for us, we should go ahead. Like I said, yes, in those days, we grew up to see some houses where they 
where the tide go. Okay, yes. At the entrance. Whoever comes in to steal, that person will never go. He will bring the broom and start sweeping until they break. Yes. That is local technology. <laughs> or indigenous technology. Yes. 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 Yes, question, yes. Are
and other members and the participants. Yes. As I earlier said, my name is Dr. Fagun Felix Iwoli, Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Yaba College of Technology. Uh, the title of my paper, Effect of Transport Planning and Logistic Management in Effective Facility Maintenance and uh, Management. Uh, dear participants, uh, we are very sorry, we are trying to connect, we are happy challenge to connect what I have in that of so that I can do the projection of a power point. But uh, we are trying to solve that. So in order not to waste time, uh, let me proceed uh, in this lecture why we are trying to put the power point. As I said earlier on, uh, the title of this lecture is uh, the effect of transport planning and the logistics management in effective facility management and maintenance. That is the title of this uh, lecture. Uh, we are going to, this lecture try to look at the effect of transport planning and the logistics management, how it has effect on uh, facility management. Uh, as we all know that uh, in facility management, we need the movement of materials from the point of uh, delivery to where these uh, materials are needed. That is, we are the maintainers of uh, facilities are needed. We are the management of uh, facilities are needed. So the lecture is trying to establish that uh, if you don't have effective transport planning and the uh, logistics supply, there will be problems, there will be go slow in the delivery of materials. So, because effective materials handling and supply ensure timely delivery of project. Reduce waste of materials, control the supply of materials. Similarly, it promotes uh, client satisfaction and ensure high economic return of investment. So, if we plan the movement of materials needed, so the time that we will require to manage or maintain the facility will reduce and then equally reduce waste of materials because the movement of materials has been planned and similarly we able to control the materials because we have planned the type of material we needed at different period of time so we cannot emphasize the importance of planning in effective maintenance of uh, uh, facilities. Then when we look at um, the facility management, I know lecture has been delivered on what is uh, the facility management. But similarly, this lecture equally look at what are the functions and the duty of a facility manager. This includes maintainers, and if I facility manager, you deal with issue of maintenance, repairs, refurbishment, building services, operations, housekeeping, and the public uh, facility management. Those are the major areas that a facility manager will deal with. So, because of this, the service of uh, conversion of transport, operation, and the logistics supply 
should not be regarded as a waste or cost or a thinner cost to facility management. That we should not look at uh, transport planning and logistic management as a cost to facility management because it's a key area in uh, facility management. Rather, it should be seen as a means of effective project delivery to maximize the use of uh, scarce resources. Let me go direct to look at the categories of uh, facility management, the categories. Then we have maintenance, repair, and refurbishment. And we have energy and water management. We have building services and operation. We have health, safety, and hygiene. We have housekeeping and the urban facility management. What is urban facility management? When we say urban facility management, we are talking about management of public facilities that are located at different areas in urban area. This area is equally a major area in uh, facility management. So let's look at the categories of materials needed in uh, facility management. We have engineer to order materials. These are special terms that are needed by a manufacturer and based on the detailed design. That is when we categorize the materials as engineer to order materials. It's a category of materials that are made based on the uh, design. So we have we equally have the made to order uh, materials. They are components that are fabricated or fabricated upon receiving uh, orders without intensive need of detailed design information. You see categories of the, of the materials made. So this one is all made according to the design. So but uh, information uh, provided in design is equally needed in making this one. You equally have an assembled to others uh, materials. We equally have made to stock materials these are the common materials we have in our uh, environment in construction industry. They are not made according to the design. They are common snakes uh, and other materials. They are not made in accordance with the design. So let's look at the parties that are involved in materials handling. That is, when we say material handling, we are talking about the transport movement of materials from one place to another. Who are the parties? The first one is a client, the facility owner. It's a key part of stakeholder in material standing. The contractor, that is the facility manager, the supplier, the supplier of the materials, retailer, distributor, and the material uh, producer. They are stakeholder in material supply. I mean the materials needed for maintenance. These are the stakeholders, and they are key. They are very important. They have a vital role to play in uh, materials and handling. So when we say logistics supply, we say customer-oriented operation management with key with the five key terms: inbound logistics. Upon logistic, we only have a materials and management, we have a physical distribution, and we only have supply chain and management. These are the key area in the logistic supply. So we need to understand each of these key areas. Please go to the next slide because of time. So let's look at the supply chains in the uh, materials handling and materials uh, uh, distribution. We have supply chain. So because of this, it, we need it, it enhances time, timely and the successful execution of, of, of projects when we understand the supply chain. There are two types of uh, material flow processes. 
at least when we are talking about movement of material, we have direct deliveries. That is, the supply of materials direct. Or as a, as a factory manager, you may decide to go and procure materials by yourself without going through the third party. But uh, in doing this, it may waste your time. So it is based on this, it is suggested that uh, a third party provider uh, should be contacted in materials and supply. The third party is a separate entity, a separate firm that specializes in materials in a very long period of time. In this situation, we need to we allow the third party to handle the supply of materials. And when the project site is, is a contested area, if we have uh, a facility to be maintained in the congested area, when we have a large population, oh, they are still for us to contact the third party because it's a specialized, it's a specialist in that area. We we're able to handle the supply of materials in such a way that there won't be delay in supply rather than handling it by ourselves as a facility manager. And when there's a need to manage space, when we don't have enough space in a particular location when the management of facilities is needed, when there's no space, so and as a specialist in the material supply, as a third party, we'll be able to help us to manage the space. And it also depends on the choice of the client and the property owner. As a property owner, they decide to say that uh, he or she wants to, to, to contact the third party supplier. They decide to say that uh, the handling of materials should be done by the facility manager. So, to determine whether to use a direct supplier, supply, or third party is fully dependent on the choice of the client. Please go to the next slide. So let us look at the third party uh, producing uh, materials supply. Let us look at it. The process includes procurement. The first step in material supply is the procurement of the materials. The procurement of the materials may be handled by the third party, may equally be handled by the client, the owner of the facilities. And similarly, the facility manager may equally be uh, contacted to help in procure the materials. And some organizations equally have a procurement unit. So when the material has been procured, then the next one is the transporting, the movement of the materials, which will be handled by the third party or directly by the Owner, by the by the owner of the of the uh, facilities, the, the third uh, step is uh, warehousing. That means the storage of the materials is another area that are very that is very important in the uh, facility the management. The storage of the material because all the material cannot be used within a day, so there's need to, to provide a particular place where the materials can be uh, stored. Back the time this material will be needed on the site. And another area is uh, materials handling. The materials handling is the area is the logistic supply. The materials handling is a logistic supply. It's equally very important. And um, packaging. Packaging of materials. You realize that uh, that we need to for to package the material in, in terms of uh, quantity, in terms of number. So that is the area of packaging. So that, that we need for us to do that as a as a third party uh, supplier. And the secondary assembly and the installation of the product is equally the responsibility of the third party. Secondary and the assembly of a, a installation of products and the tracking and tracing where materials is being shipped from the manufacturer or from the point of a, a, a destination to where it's going. So there's need to, to do tracking and tracing 
if this is not done, material may miss on the road. So it is really a very important aspect of uh, managing uh, uh, materials. The next one is uh, distribution planning. So when we talk about distribution planning, we know that all material needed for maintenance of a project or a facilities, we cannot use all of them at a day. So there's a need to plan the distribution. There will not be enough space to bring all the materials we want in, at a day. So we may, we may plan the supply based on when they are needed. Currently, at this period of time, we need uh, five heap of, uh, of uh, uh, five tips of uh, sand. So we have to plan this based on the available space. So when the space is not available, so we cannot bring all the materials. Similarly, we need to plan based on the available resource to procure the materials. The owner of the property may not have uh, money in full to execute the project. So we can plan the supply of materials based on the available uh, fund. And the design and the re of the supply chain. So the responsibility of the, of the uh, third party supplier to look at uh, how to design and to re engineer. Though material have been produced by the uh, manufacturer, they have been need to re-engineer it. So the third party supplier will be able to do this one so that the material in them will be able to suit the, the need uh, on the site. Then material supply chain process. Material supply chain process. So there's a chain process of a material supply. One, we need to get information on the materials uh, required. So if we don't have adequate information on the material required, the material will not be able to be supplied. And wrong materials will be supplied if there's no adequate information. So there's a need to have adequate information on the materials needed at the site for a particular project. And then, that need to have a quotation or bill of quantity prepared for the construction or for the maintenance of, of that uh, of that uh, facilities. And then when we have this, so we may decide to award the supply of the material to the third party, as we have said earlier on. And we may even decide to do the supply of materials by ourselves or by the client. And the next one is a procurement of uh, materials, the planning, material delivery, and inspect the materials. We can't just say we have had uh, a, 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 a producer of a material. We need to inspect this material to ensure that uh, they need the quality needed as being specified by the by design. So we, so we need to inspect the materials. So as I've said earlier on, the storage of materials is very important, so which can be done by having a, a warehouse. And if you don't have a very large area of land to store the materials, we have to supply the materials based on the available space. So make use of the materials is the next step. So when material is supplied to the site for maintenance or for the construction, so the next one is to, to make use of the materials. So it is you as a facility manager that will deal with the making use of materials. So and we must ensure that the material supply meets the design, meet the specification. So if it does not meet the specification, so it is the responsibility of the facility manager to notify the top party supplier that this material is not the type of materials that needed. So we need to communicate to the supplier when there is need for more supply until the project is completed. And I said earlier on, what we not be able to procure all the materials needed, particularly when the project is a large project, it may be uh, as they needed. So we must there must be a communication between the third party supplier and the producer of the materials. And that will be that should be adequate communication between the top party 
and the facility manager who are on site using this uh, material. And another area that are very important in, uh, uh, in the material supply and the logistics management is clear the waste material and return surplus. You realize that in some cases there will be left over at the uh, site of the facilities of all the projects. So this left over it is the duty of the third party uh, material supply to ensure that the left over are clear from the site. Either to return it to the uh, producer or to dispose it. Because that, that this material, this waste material may be in pieces. They are still useful for other things. So and they are still useful for other other projects. This waste material can be disposed of. So this can be contacted to third party uh, supplier to ensure that the site where the maintenance is being carried over is clear and is clean. So let's look at the efficient transport for sustainable material supply. As I said earlier on, you know that transport is the movement of uh, goods and services from where, uh, from, from the location to where these are needed. And we know that the efficient transport system makes delivery of uh, materials easier and uh, using logistics uh, supply. And the four major modes of uh, transport exist. This includes uh, road, transport, rail, water, and the air. In some cases, all these uh, four modes of uh, mobility will be needed in supply of materials. This depends on the location of the materials, whether it is uh, being imported, and uh, whether the materials is in large quantity. These four modes of transport will be needed, and equally depend on the location of the site being the uh, Manage. And the movement of material may require, as I said, more than one mode of transport. And then we know that the road transport is central to movement of materials. Because there are some places you want to move materials to that will not start from, from land. Either we are taking to the water, to the ocean, to, 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 to start from the land. So we cannot rule out the importance of uh, road transport in materials uh, uh, movement. And uh, we know that uh, in, in order to ensure that uh, the materials is uh, supplied adequately, and we know that uh, the primary concern to select the mode of transport cost is uh, based on the fact that the quality to 66% of the logistic cost is from transport. Because transport is central, so when we are talking about logistics, I mean the movement of materials to the site. So transport takes a larger proportion of uh, logistic uh, cost. So we need to plan the movement of goods uh, very well. Other factor to be considered in transport issue is a uh, road network. We need to consider the road network in the movement of uh, materials. We probably need to consider the congestion because congestion can create delay and uncertainty in materials movement. So because of this, we need to consider the third party as a professional in the supply of the materials. The August in project completion date, if we don't plan the supply of materials, we will need to shift in the project date. So we need to plan the movement of materials very well. And in order to promote efficient in road uh, transport. So they need to ensure, please go, go to the next slide, please. Uh, slide, I think that's slide 16. So we, we need to ensure that uh, good road network and condition and it may the site. So that you, be, you must ensure that uh, we understand the road network and the condition and the linking the site and the adequate installation of the road signals and signs. No, we are not the one that will do this one. But we are trying to say that in transport planning, in order to ensure that the materials, we will be able to move materials efficiently. So if there are small signals on road, 
and science. So the the transporter or the vehicle moving the good, the material from the location to the where it is needed, they miss the road if there are some signals on road. And effective road and traffic management is fully needed. And adequate, adequate modern equipment for traffic control and effective accident prevention and the road disaster management. Because you want to move materials on road, so we must ensure that uh, we prevent, we put uh, adequate mechanism to prevent uh, accident and the disaster on road. And the employment of adequate manpower for roads and the traffic management. And adequate training of road and the traffic management uh, uh, manpower. All these are needed for planning of a uh, of a movement of goods and the, and surfaces to where they are needed. And uh, the planning of a delivery of materials comprises three main uh, components: scheduling. You have to know how to schedule. I have said earlier on the materials. We have to schedule the materials based on where they are needed. The material needed for a particular aspect of management or maintenance of a, of a, a facility should be supplied when these materials are needed. The material that will be needed later should not be brought earlier. So we have to prepare a schedule of supply of uh, materials. And then uh, we have to look of a time of delivery. So it's an agreement. How are we going to deliver these materials? It's an agreement between the supplier and contra uh, the contractor on materials and delivery. So there should be an agreement on how to deliver this and mode of delivery. How this material will be delivered. And we know that it's until material gets to the site, we know that materials is delivered. So any transporter that will help in movement of uh, materials from the location to where they are needed. The major mode of delivery is on-site uh, delivery. So that's what they are so negotiation. And then, um, have a look at this. So let us look at the importance of uh, logistic, logistic supply, uh, planning in materials uh, supply. It promotes effective management of space, help in managing time and labor, thereby enhancing economic return of investment. That when we plan the movement of uh, materials, it will help us uh, in the time when we feel of a project, because we have planned the movement of materials. That won't be delayed in the movement of materials. That won't be over supply, that won't be under uh, supply when this is done. And it equally promotes timely delivery of projects and improve customer satisfaction. So when you get a contract and uh, the, the movement of a material is well planned, so you are able to satisfy the need of your client because you are able to deliver the, the project as well required. And the effective supply chain and the preferred excessive waste of materials. When you plan the movement of materials in terms of logistics and the transportation, so to prevent waste on site, because the, the material will not be supplied in messes of more than what is uh, needed. And then uh, it will reduce capital time of the material supply. It means that the material that, is not, that are not needed now will not be supplied. So in this situation, it will not tie the, the scarce resources, it will not tie it down. It may be possible to separate material supply from project execution, thereby create more area of specialization. When we separate the supply of materials from project execution, so it will create job for some of us who love uh, supply of materials. But when we lump everything together, it will be cumbersome for you as a, a facility manager to combine the procurement of materials with the job of um, ma managing the, the, the facilities. And it will equally encourage continuous supply of material without hindering the project execution because 
we secure material and contacted to a specialist. So to uh, it will uh, uh, enhance continuity in the project uh, execution. So I want to conclude my paper by saying that uh, adequate funding management and uh, maintenance is central to sustainable built environment. This is only possible with effective transport planning and logistic management for the supply of materials. Uh, transport planning and logistic management help in maximizing the use of available resources such as fund, labor, time and space with high economic return of investment. Therefore, a specialist in materials handling should be contacted, particularly if the project is huge, located or in a congested place, or if the completion will require a long time. So that is the conclusion of my lecture. Please, we can appreciate you more. Thank you so much um, for uh, enriching us with your words of experience. And, uh, we want to believe that uh, we have, you have loaded us um, with more knowledge of what we came in here with. And we are sure of going back with something better of what we know or our base of knowledge that we have about um, facilities in terms of security and the paper they just uh, delivered to us. Once again, we want to appreciate you for this. Thank you so much. I hope uh, when as we call you, you will be at the tip of um, um, uh, our hand and respond to us. Sir. Thank you so much. We are almost coming to the um, the head of today's uh, activities, but uh, we feel it will not overwhelm and it will not be good for us to uh, for us have a discussion on uh, a question and answer. Probably um, while we are doing the question and answer for the other three papers we did, you may have forgotten you want to ask one or two questions, or probably in this uh, just uh, uh, wrap up uh, two papers that we just had. Um, Handing for those who are online and for those who are here physically, it's time for us to ask our um, facilitators um, whatever questions I feel we need to ask them. They are very hot and they are ready to attend to our questions. So it's time for a question and answer for our facilitators. Thank you. Any question? Do we have any question? I have. Uh, all right. We have it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Falcon, for the wonderful presentation. While the lecture was in progress, I received few messages on my WhatsApp, which were in line with uh, what you just shared with us. This happened to be a small project, and uh, it has to do with uh, decorations and what have you. We have not got into that level and there was no need for us to bring in materials required for the decoration work. However, the vendor to handle the decoration has given us his proposal, we have negotiated. Now we are ready for the decoration and we ask him to move in. He said no, material prices are changed in the market. So he has to go to the market to rework his proposal based on the prevailing market uh, prices. That is one. Yes, in the past, we have uh, taken a pro proactive uh, action in safeguarding something like this by paying, what, by paying for what we need to the suppliers. And immediately there was a review of price upward. We got there to pick items, the supplier said no, we cannot release those items to us at that whole price we paid. We have to add the extra. 
And if it's common, we can go to select also. If you pay, for instance, you secure the job, and uh, you just believe that, okay, the money is there, let me pay for the quantity of cement I need, and you pay for it. If there is any reason for price review upward, and you have not taken your order from Rangote, Rangote will not deliver to you based on the old order you made. You have to pay the current uh, price. How do we manage this? Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, for that uh, question. Uh, you know, in our situation, where the, the the market is not stable, we have to look at that area very well. Mm. In some this situation, we have to look at we have to separate this thing that cannot be mixed up. So that's why I observe that the procurement of materials should be separated where you probably the client or the facility manager will firstly procure the material then the supply cannot be handled by the third party you mentioned uh, that good thing as a case study so i don't think uh, we can generalize uh, that the situation of that good thing that that good is not the only one uh, complete supply uh, Cement. We can, if that water is doing that, we can go to other uh, materials uh, producer that uh, will not be, uh, that, that, that will take, we have paid already. And then uh, why do you now say that uh, you need to apply based on what we have, we have paid, based on the prevailing price at that particular time? So the next is to look at uh, other uh, materials uh, producer and look at it what we can gain from that place. So that's my own uh, observation in that area. Because changing in price is becoming a common phenomenon now. And uh, when you are getting a contract, you have to look at that too. As a fashion manager, you have to look at that. Uh, the variation in materials, you have to consider it in, uh, in negotiating the cost of a particular project. So that's my own uh, uh, observation. Uh, let me quickly respond to that. Yes, uh, La Farge has not been doing that in the past, but the issue, the racketeering in the cement industry eh, has not become something that if Dangote initiate the move and others do not join, there will be Wahala for them. So, as I was talking to people now, because it's been long, I patronized the uh, Lafat. Someone told me that Lafat also has joined Angote in implementing such uh, uh, initiatives. That is, when you pay and you do not collect your order immediately, and you still have order with them, and there is review, upper review of cement prices upward, you have to pay extra before they give you the order. So, you know, like it in is this part of the world that we find ourselves is a, is a, is a critical uh, issue. Uh, that is part of that's what is happening in our own area. Imagine, can we now say that uh, in another country where they where the where the everything is well planned? So and when you look at the uh, Nigeria factor, we have our own capitalist uh, system of uh, of a big business is, is very disturbing. So I think uh, the Nigeria situation is a special, special case that uh, you only use your uh, knowledge as an experience to handle it. And the only area I can say is that when you procure material like that, probably you you decide to take it away from the from the assigned immediately. Yes. But the storage facility is the issue. That's another thing. Yes, I think what, what we need to strengthen is our consumer protection laws. Yes, consumer protection laws. Yes, you know Nigeria in maintaining on law and order is has become a problem in Nigeria. I think another area that we can look at is wholesaler. 
they the, also do same, sir. They are the yeah, worst. Yeah, yeah. They are the worst, sir. Why is not the whole sellers for the manufacturers like that? Why won't you say that? Uh, no, the, the point is this. Let us look at it from business yeah, angle. I gave yeah, wait, yeah. wait. I gave you I paid for material yeah, that yeah. I, I don't need now. Are you telling me you that you just get my money? money. You are not in my money for business. Exactly. So why should you now tell me that okay, because I didn't collect what I ordered for immediately. And I'll now pay it to your account. Exactly. So when we look at it eh, morally, religiously, economically, it is not good. No, what I was saying was that if the manufacturer has that behavior, why would the wholesaler to have the same behavior? If my daddy is bad, how will I teach her not be bad? So that was happening. Because the wholesaler to have to buy it. in that situation, in my own, uh, you, you may mention of enforcement of, uh, of law. You know Nigeria is very weak in enforcing law. I think what we can do is to factor this into uh, our negotiation with our clients. When we are getting a good deal, we have to factor the variation in price into it. So I think this one we call it here. This one we call it here. Uh, and uh, probably if the project is a long time project, then you look at it that you separate the cost of materials. You remove it from the your own aspect. And okay, this is the cost of materials. This is what I'm going to take as a facility manager, or as a contractor, or as a duty, as a duty engineer. This is what I'm going to take for my own service. Then the procurement of materials, then we'll be, we'll be paying this on as the materials are needed because the price of material will change over time. So and we know that in Nigeria the price will never come down. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. With respect to what you have said earlier, yeah. my name is Rafael Yawitan. So we went to already some time ago to get. Hello. Yeah, we went to already some time ago to get a uh, tight material for the project. So we made payments, like uh, let's say four million naira. So we are buying bulk of material. So we went to the other side to get the other material. We are transporting with a one single truck. We spent like 40 minutes in the next shop before he came back. That's all that. You can't So it's easier to have money on the shop, put that money back. And I think I get that price, I said that's tough. Sir, you see what I said? What can we do? So who will be at that difference? I feel me or the client himself. What is a true life story? Right. 
He's never done anything like that. He's only like, he's only like the animal discovery of art. He's never done like that. Let me see, if he has sit there for 24 hours, if there is a cabinet at the back of the receipt, then we are, we are not covered. But if there is not such a thing, it's not there. You are covered. I think that's my own submission. Thank you. Any other contribution? Do you have anybody online? I want to see you. Anybody online? Anybody online? Please check. Do you have anybody online? IT. IT. Our tech uh, personnel. We don't. It's all right. Thank you. Thank you so much for the participatory contribution. Um, uh, um, I don't really think we, we have done much, much of the discussion <laughs> because uh, I, I felt uh, after the question, you know, this to lead us to whatever discussion that we have. But I don't think we really have any discussion basically on what we have done so far. Then we still have to have, um, explore some of the papers we have done, just a little discussion, or if you feel we are fine with it. And then, let, let me, yes. Why, the, why Dr. Fagbon was uh, delivering his lecture? He was making emphasis on uh, either maintenance, uh, maintenance projects or new projects. That should not be surprising because another move now to enlarge the scope of facilities management is facilities managers will now be involved on new construction, new projects. Is that clear? Not just managing the facility when it is completed, right from the inception. Is that clear? Because most of the problems we encounter at post-construction phase will, be, will now be looked into by the facilities management at the conceptual and the construction stages. So it is something we are moving. For complex projects, right from the special inception, facilities managers are brought on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. On this note, we once again, on behalf of uh, the um, executive and management of the uh, institution, we want to say thank you for your rapt attention for your patience, for your time. Um, for those who are online, we also understand that uh, we are also trying to squeeze our time to also be part of this uh, program. We want to appreciate you so your attention. We want to thank you for coming. And uh, we also want to use this medium to, um, for those that are here physically, please immediately after this, who is a common to have a short uh, uh, photograph for record purpose, please. So it's important to um, take time to please let's just take a short I mean um, a little uh, good photograph. And please, I also want to um, uh, implore us that we should not be destroyed with this. Tomorrow you'll be surprised with the um, uh, uh, turnout of people that you see here. Some have called us for this one or two reasons they could not attend this guy today, but I'm sure tomorrow. It's going to be an improved attendant. So, if you are the type that you think you sit in the front uh, today, you may be surprised by the time you come here tomorrow, it might be at the back and you sit. So, once again, I want to appreciate you for coming. We say, um, as you go to our various destinations, we wish everyone of us uh, a safe trip back home. Please, I have um, shared the schedule of the training to all of us. If you don't have a copy here, please, and they want to see me. So, that will guide us to know. Uh, the time for us to commence uh, tomorrow. Although we have a little, um, um, uh, we started a little late today. We don't want that to happen tomorrow. And that's why I'm taking time to share this with us so that we can plan our schedule. So that some of us are allowed to come from the far distance to live ahead um, at our various place. So thank you. The program starts 9.15 tomorrow on Dogs by Bus Space. So I wish you all a safe trip back to your destination. Thank you. Namaste. So please let us um put that outside. Please let's have the photograph outside, please. Thank you.